Episode 226, Tuition, 2. Colosio Academy's tuition payment season has arrived. Hey! Did you pay tuition? Tuition? Was there something like that at our school? I think the butler came yesterday and paid the bill and left. I remember paying for four years at once when I entered school. How do you study while worrying about such trivial things? In most cases, we pass by without even knowing whether this season is coming or not. What do we do? I heard my father couldn't find tuition for this semester. Should I take a leave of absence? Ha, this isn't a part-time job. Do I have to worry about this all four years? In the case of some students, their faces could not help but be filled with worry. The academy's tuition is so high that it can be a burden not only for commoners but also for nobles if their families are small. It is a bitter reality that even at Colosio Academy, where admission is said to be as difficult as finding a star in the sky, there are always a few students taking a leave of absence or dropping out starting from this season every year. So now Vikir is worried. Now that I think about it, I didn't get a full scholarship. Perhaps because my attitude score was so bad, I didn't receive a full scholarship. However, since approximately 80% of the scholarships were awarded to applicants with excellent grades, the amount itself was not that burdensome. This was surprisingly possible thanks to a letter of recommendation from Professor Banshee, whom I had never asked for or expected. Joy. I don't know. When Vikir went to say thank you, Professor Banshee only snorted without taking his eyes off the book he was reading. Well, anyway. But even so, since I decided not to get help from the Baskervilles or Thindy Wendy, I have to ask for tuition. The reason why Vikir stubbornly did not bring in external money was simple. Backtracking of demons. It is to prevent that. In order to raise military funds, you must decide on a method of money transaction, the most popular being a borrowed name account or cash hiding. Vikir has seen too many hunting dogs lose their lives due to being traced back by the enemy or betrayed by intermediary contacts in the process of raising military funds. Unless it is truly necessary, contacts should be kept to a minimum, and especially the financial lines that can be stepped on first should be thoroughly hidden. The best way to hide something is to prevent it from existing in the first place. So Vikir had no contact with either Baskerville Garden or Thindi Wendy regarding financial matters. In preparation for the moment when you really need big money. Thanks to Professor Banshee's letter of recommendation for a scholarship, I just need to make up for the rest. Vikir mumbled while fiddling with the tuition bill. Essentially, the most optimal way to raise military funds is to raise military funds directly in the field. I need to look for a high paying, short term part time job. Vikir moved to Hall A, the central lobby of the lecture building. There were numerous posters posted on the walls of the square on the first floor, and some of them were clearly looking for part-time jobs. You can already see high school students in need of part-time positions gathered in front of the bulletin board. At that time, Vikir spotted a familiar face. Sinclair, a girl with white hair. She was staring at the flyers on the bulletin board. Hmm. There's a month and a half until tuition is due should I increase my part-time job. What I'm doing right now is tutoring, part-time work at a cafe, and librarianship should I take another tutoring class when I have some free time on the weekend. No, that doesn't mean you can reduce your volunteer work hours. Sinclair has the best grades among the first-year students. She was also working a part-time job, splitting her time between studying. And how many baths? When they saw her regularly going out to volunteer work, other students just said she was a monster. However, Bikir was also carrying out a further forced march, although it was not revealed. Because he goes out every night and assassinates future enemies of the human coalition. However, assassination costs money, but it does not make money. Moreover, Bikir was acting single-mindedly by collecting all the illicit wealth belonging to the assassination target and secretly throwing it into facilities such as orphanages. I had been doing that all the time since I met and parted ways with the Nymphet during the Dantalian War. Therefore, there was little wealth currently in Bakir's hands. At most, I can buy supplies for next week's class. So, no matter what, I am in a situation where I have to find a part-time job. Bakir stood at a distance from Sinclair so as not to disturb him. 
and I read one by one the numerous colorful advertising flyers covering the bulletin board. They're all just rubbish. Vikir continued to browse the bulletin board, ignoring most of the advertisements, and soon found a short-term part-time job that was perfect for him. Monster hunting part-time job, catch low-level monsters and make easy money. Zero zero with the hunting guild's attendance, I too am a hunter. It was a part-time job killing ecosystem-disrupting monsters with a bounty on them and selling the byproducts. This type of part-time job is usually done through a hunting guild or a mercenary guild. You can visit the guild to leave or receive requests, and if you wish, you can also request personnel to be dispatched. The difficulty of the subjugation quest that can be performed can be selected by the individual, and depending on the tendency, type, and prestige of the guild, it is possible to hire mercenaries such as warriors and wizards, auxiliary occupations such as hunters, alchemists, cooks, and blacksmiths, and even guides and porters. Did. A structure where you can become a client, carry out someone else's request, hire a separate mercenary, or become a mercenary yourself. In other words, a guild is basically a large form of labor. Of course, it is a bit unusual that the price is clearly defined in the form of money. The students at Colosio Academy are generally skilled and many mercenaries. Although the hunting guild welcomed them, there was no need for academy students to work with them. Except for cases where some urgent money is needed, like the current Vakir. When Vikir returned to the dormitory after completing all his schedules, he saw Tudor and Sancho coming to play in his room. The two were receiving private lessons in subjects that Piggy was lacking in. So, here we are once again pointing out the administrative definition of settlement. Now, the income and expenditure performance of one fiscal year are calculated as deterministic coefficients and the imperial family must submit an imperial settlement report inspected by the Board of Audit and Inspection to the Senate the heads of each of the seven great families compile the fund settlement report for each fiscal year into the Central Government Office Settlement Report. Hmm. No matter how I look at public administration, I can't get used to it. I think informatics is more difficult. I don't think you have the constitution for an office job. Tudor and Sancho were impressed by Piggy's administrative, clerical, and intelligence analysis and gathering skills. Moreover, Piggy is good at teaching, so he is able to explain the professor's words well, which he did not understand even if he only heard about cancer. In this way, Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy are concentrating on their studies by putting their heads together. It was a win win study where we helped each other during the practical and written exams. Meanwhile, Bikir entered. I'm sorry during the study period, friends. Just take your coat and go out. Then Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy turned their heads with happy expressions. Oh. Bikir arrived at the right time. Are you good at studying too? Help us. This time, please Bianca, I have to beat that obnoxious guy. Save me, Bikir. I need to avoid failing the written exam next week right away. I want to break the prejudice that people are big but foolish. I have a lot of issues I want to discuss with you too, Bakir. Just last week's paper test, there was controversy over multiple correct answers in the final multiple choice question. But Bakir shook his head resolutely. This is because tuition was more urgent than next week's written test. I have to go out and make money. Vikir briefly explained the situation, and his friends looked surprised when they heard it. Tudor said, rubbing his chin. I thought you were good at studying and had excellent practical skills, so you must have been the son of a noble family with a hidden identity, or your parents were commoners, but you were extremely wealthy. If tuition is that urgent, I'll just pay it, buddy. What does it mean to like friends? Our family has a lot of money. Of course, Vikir refused. This was due to problems related to funding. If you get stepped on by the devil, you can't just cause sparks to fly at Tudor. When Vikir shook his head, Tudor looked regretful. Eh. Why? If it's a burden, you can pay it back slowly. Are you worried that your family will ask you to get a job after graduation? If that's the case, you don't have to worry. You know I'm not that kind of public person. Well, my younger sister is begging me to bring you home during vacation and introduce you to her. It's not just because of that. Sancho and Piggy explained Vikir's situation to Tudor. 
I learned that it is not good to exchange money directly between friends, no matter how close they are. It's also a matter of pride. That's right, Tudor. I'm sure Vikir would really appreciate your heart. Vikir, who was usually quiet, also nodded once towards Tudor, and only then did Tudor's expression brighten again. So. How are you going to raise the money? Let's mock a method together. Is that okay? Hmm. I already have a method in mind. Led by Tudor, who spoke in response to Vikir's answer, Sancho and Piggy also pricked up their ears. To those grateful friends, Vikir asked briefly. Do you know of a good hunting guild for short runs? Episode 227, Tuition, 3. Hunter Guild, Sherpa, is an outsourcing dispatch company that dispatches hunters and guides needed to hunt monsters. Although this guild did not have mercenaries with outstanding military strength, it was famous for having many guides who were knowledgeable about the monster ecosystem and geography. The guides here, all of whom are natives of the area for three or more generations, know intimately where various rare monsters are hiding and where they form colonies. Of course, he knows shortcuts and secret escape routes. However, since the only classes that could be dispatched were guides or porters, the guild was always in a small situation. This is because even after the subjugation quest is over, you have to endure unfair treatment, such as not being properly recognized for your achievements or having your compensation cut. However, the presence of the captain leading the Sherpa Guild steadfastly supported the guild members even in these difficult circumstances. GG Geek The main door of the guild opened. The guild members who were training in the training hall looked around at the main gate of the guild office and shouted in unison. The guild leader is coming to work. Attention. Salute. Hello. A man who commands the respect of all guild members. He was a huge man with a height of 2 meters and 30 centimeters and a weight of close to 180 kilograms. A tightly shaved sports head, knife marks running horizontally and vertically across the face, heavy armor-like muscles covering the entire body, and even the martial arts skills on the graduator. The name of this man, who looks like a huge beast of prey, is Miniature Pincher, also known as Mini Pin. How many people would be able to pay for his labor just by looking at his appearance? As long as Min Fin, who has both a scary appearance and scary skills, reigns as the guild leader, the Sherpa Guild can survive. He was even famous for being completely meritorious and being ruthless when training guild members. If you sweat a lot during training, you will bleed less during battle. The expressions of the guild members who were running around the parade ground became firm again at the thunder-like words emanating from the minipin. It was all thanks to him that the porters and guides of the Sherpa guild were armed with steel-like physical strength and mental strength. Moreover, minipin's inaction is like a graduator. She was at a level where she could belong to any top-tier mercenary guild. Even in the Empire's armed forces, scouts are coming as military officer training assistants. However, Minipin was rejecting all these proposals. I like hunting. Fighting monsters is my calling. This was Minipin's belief. If I were to be more specific, I had a small wish to someday belong to the Baskervilles guarding the Western Front, but that was a distant possibility as there was no way they would send me a scouting offer first. So Minipin's primary goal was to preserve and protect the existing guild. To do that, we need to select employers. After going to work at the office, Minfin looked through the newly received requests. Let's see, this is a request to dispatch a porter from another mercenary guild. The Nampian live for research purposes but the number of participants is too small. If they get caught, the porters will die. Dismissed. Is this a request for commercial directions? Hmm, but the level of military power of the escorting mercenaries is way below expectations. We may lose our guides. This too is rejected. We do not accept requests from strangers. Of the mountain of request details, almost 90% were filtered out. Min Fin clicked his tongue. How many of these will be alive until next year? There were too many people who wanted to subdue strong monsters without knowing their own worth. If you give them porters or guides, they will most likely be wiped out. Porters and guides are the first to be used as shields in times of crisis because they have weak weapons and a slow escape speed. I can't lose members of the same guild like that. 
Therefore, Minipin thoroughly filtered out weak or reckless clients through interviews. We mainly accept clients who submit a mercenary badge or mercenary ID card proving that they are a strong mercenary, or have served in the military, and those with less experience are rejected, no matter how small the request. This was exactly the same situation as now. What? Academy student? Is that also a first year? Minipin reviewed the last submitted request form in front of him. A newbie at an academy requested to hire a guide. Request details. Name, Vakir. Affiliation, Colossio Academy. Request, hire one guide. Purpose, subdue monsters. Usually, students belonging to the academy do not visit places like this often. This is because they are all children of rich families. However, there are some oddballs who visit these places occasionally, but most of them are just out of mild curiosity or a desire to experience life in the lower class. And from the hunting guild's perspective, if they indulge in the mediocre entertainment of their children, they are bound to lose precious colleagues who have been with them for decades. Ha! Huh. What would a master from the academy do in a place like this? Do you feel like enjoying the entertainment? There isn't even any information about what monsters to catch. I just want to hire a guide. Of course, it was a request that wasn't even worth worrying about. Minipin crumpled up the request form and threw it in the trash can. Give me a glass of milk and send me back. You brat, you think subjugation quests are a joke for Sinims? Minipin completely ignored Vakir's request details. And that was the beginning of all the tragedies that followed from that night. Night. The moon hasn't even risen. Min Fin returned home after working overtime. When I returned home, I saw my rabbit-like wife and my bear-like child already sleeping in bed. Min Fin, who passed through the living room and entered the kitchen, was hungry and rummaged through the storage room. She was planning to boil some potatoes for a late-night snack. At that time, Minnie Pin found a late-night snack on the kitchen table. Eggs, bacon, grilled cornbread, etc. were laid out. Although it has cooled down, it still looks delicious. Honey. Minnie Pin looked back at his sleeping wife and muttered lowly. She got married when she was young and had a hard time, and I am always thankful and sorry for my daughter who has never done anything for me but is growing up well. Please be patient. Someday, I will solve a big request and help you improve. Min Fin went into the bedroom thinking that he would have to work even harder as the head of the household. My wife seems to have fallen asleep while putting my daughter to sleep, so today I have the large bed to myself. Eventually, when Min Fin put on his arm pillow and closed his eyes. Rustling. A small noise began to come from the bedroom's second floor window. What? Min Fin yawned and woke up. Then I saw a silhouette climbing through the window. A man wearing a black mask opens a second floor window and comes inside. Mini Pin smiled. Since he didn't have a knife or anything in his hand, he must have been a petty thief. But he was truly an unlucky petty thief. Even if I came in anyway. The guild leader of the Sherpa Guild and the leader of all guides. He has the incompetence of a graduate, and even the Imperial Army and prominent mercenary guilds send him love calls, so he comes to rob his house. I guess I'll have to take some care of it. After subduing him, should I report to Tyler and discipline him, or should I hand him over to the Imperial Guard? Actually, Minipin has been like this a few times. Minipin harshly scolded petty thieves who climbed over the fence due to hunger and then guided them, and now they have become his indispensable younger brothers and subordinates. So this time, after suppressing him and listening to the circumstances of his coming in to steal, I was willing to turn a blind eye if the circumstances were too bad. Hey! Wait, stop there. If you surrender now, they might turn a blind eye. However, it was Min Fin who really had his eyes closed. Pow! The black masked man threw his fist at lightning speed. It grazed the tip of Min Pin's ear, broke off a few strands of hair, and then shot off to the side. The moment the Mini Pin swallowed the air, a hole appeared in the wall next to it. Sigh! A fist-shaped hole was made in a wall made of solid wood. This is a warning. An eerie voice came out from the masked man's mouth. A line of cold sweat runs down Minipin's spine. If it was right. 
If I had been hit squarely in the face by that fist, my skull would have been crushed like a grain of sand. A level beyond human power. Does it even use mana? Otherwise, there is no explanation. This guy. How dare you know who I am? Minipin realized that his opponent was not normal and immediately raised his mana. Graduator Junior, the hazy energy between gas and liquid was in Minipin's fist. But. Crackle. The other person also raises his fist. Surprisingly, his fist didn't have a single ounce of mana. Only then did Minipin realize that the opponent's punch just before had been made by pure strength. What kind of power does this guy have? I get chills for a moment. If a body emits such power even without using mana, what would be the result if mana was used? I'm glad he doesn't seem to be able to use mana. How many years has it been since I was thrilled by someone else's pure physical strength? The moment Minipin breathes a sigh of relief. Fit. Surprisingly, mana began to gush out from the intruder's two fists. But Minipin was not surprised. Pow. This is because my memory was cut off from the moment I thought the other person's fist was flying under my chin. Episode 228, Tuition, 4. Next day. Minipin opened his eyes. Is this a dream? But that can't be true. He woke up lying face down on the cold floor, and when he woke up, his chin was swollen. There was only a blanket covering him. At that moment, an ominous intuition passes through his mind. Oh, no. Honey. Talum. Minipin kicked the floor and ran down the stairs to the second floor. But. Woke up. Dad. Good morning. My wife and daughter were greeting Minpin with seemingly fine looks. Uh. Minipin had a blank expression. There was a warm fire in the fireplace, and sweet potatoes, potatoes, and corn were cooking. There was a bubbling sound and the smell of chicken stew coming from the kitchen. Flower petals were floating in the teacup, and outside the window, white laundry was drying gently in the sun and wind. Minipin was bewildered by everyday life where everything remained the same. His wife and daughter's attitude toward him was the same as usual. The house was also no different from yesterday. Oh, you too. Why were you sleeping on the floor? It was so heavy I couldn't even move it. What's going on with your sleeping habits? Uh, ha. Huh. Me on the floor. Ha. Huh. I heard you sleep well lying on the floor. No matter how many times I woke him up, he wouldn't wake up, so I just covered him with a blanket and left. Isn't your neck sore? My wife's hand slapping Minipin's back is harsh. Uh, no. Did anything happen yesterday? There was a thief. What? Thief? How can I hear something like that when you're here? Some guy with a big liver. Oh, no, whatever. I had a bad dream. Ugh, it's because you sleep in a strange position. By the way, please take some sweet potatoes and corn out of the fireplace. I think they are all cooked. Oh, I added the potatoes a little late, so just leave them alone. My wife seemed to know nothing. Min Fin sat at the table with a puzzled expression and ate the breakfast his wife had prepared. And like usual, I left the house on time and headed to the guild office. The street scene was also very ordinary and routine. Neighbors who greet you as you leave the fence, subordinates who bow their heads when you meet them on their way to work. Was it really a dream? But no matter how much you think about it, no. The chin was obviously swollen and the hole in the wooden wall was still the same. So, some crazy guy broke into the house, punched Min Pin in the chin, and then went back home. Even without shaking anything. What on earth was he doing? Min Fin shook his head. I pledged to strictly lock down the door tonight. That night. Min Fin, lying in bed, closed his eyes only after seeing his wife sleeping safely. Bushy. If it weren't for the small noise coming from the window again. S no way. Min Fin looked at the window. The crazy guy from yesterday was standing there again. An intruder silently picked the lock on the window and crossed the threshold. He was even deliberately making noise by crumpling a piece of paper in his hand to show off his ghost-like presence. Rushing, rushing. 
The sight is truly eerie and gives the viewer goosebumps. I won't watch it this time. Minipin had hidden his beloved sword by his bedside, just in case. Sarung. I'm fortunate that my wife is the type that doesn't mind carrying me once she falls asleep. This large sword unleashes terrifying lethal force just by being pulled out of its sheath. Die. Minipin rushed towards the intruder, swinging his great sword. However. Teak. Something unbelievable happened. The aura of a graduator that rotates at high speed and cuts everything. The overlaid sword was blocked. Even in the intruder's bare hands. Quagajik. Pack. Quick. Graduator's sword and aura were blocked. It was even breaking down little by little day by day. This doesn't make any sense. Minipin was astonished at the situation unfolding before his eyes. But even that surprise was not allowed until the end. Puck. This is because the fist that flew into his chin again cut off his consciousness. Are you having bad sleeping habits these days? When I wake up in the morning, my wife asks me as if nothing has happened. Even this morning, Min Fin, who opened his eyes face down on the floor, was unable to respond. How should I say it? He is said to repeatedly faint from being hit on the chin by intruders who attack him every night. It is a heartbreaking story that cannot be told not only to his wife, but also to his friends, colleagues, and subordinates. I can't do this. I'll have to contact the ecliptic guard tonight. For the first time in my life, I rely on the power of public power. Minipin finished getting ready for work, making an important decision in his mind. After that night, the next morning. Mr. Minipin. Is the report accurate? An investigator from the Imperial Guard, who stayed up all night, rubs his sleepy eyes and asks. Minipin couldn't answer anything. The intruder didn't come last night. The investigators of the Ecliptic Guard looked up at Minipin's massive physique and said. Common sense tells me that there would be no thief who could rob Mr. Minfin's house. Besides, you can capture a graduate-level aura with your bare hands. What nonsense, why would someone with such skills become a petty thief in the first place? You said you haven't held a grudge against anyone recently. Hmm, stalking due to passion. Anyway. We are not free, so we will not be able to provide overnight security like this in the future. It's a bit hard to call it a substitute, but we will strengthen patrols in this area a little more in the future. Goodbye. In the end, Minipin had to bow his head several times and send the investigators of the Imperial Guard away. And surprisingly, that night. Bushy. An intruder came to visit. Aya. You bastard. What are you really doing? Minfin, wearing two helmets, ran out swinging the sword in both hands, and the result was the same as usual. Knock, knock. Two helmets were broken and two swords were broken. Min Fin was hit in the chin again and fainted. The next day too. The next day too. The next day after that too. The midnight visits continued. The morning dawned and Minipin Pin sat on the sofa in the guild office with a dejected heart after confirming that nothing had been stolen from the house. Just in case, my wife and daughter have already evacuated to a relative's house. From that day on, Min Fin became a man who was afraid of the night. There's no way I wouldn't be scared when some crazy guy keeps coming through the window, hitting just one person and then disappearing. It was a very effective and violent natural sleeping pill. I've been suffering from stress-related insomnia recently, is this a popular new insomnia therapy? Of course that can't be true. But I can't mention this to the guild leader, so I just whine. If I told the Imperial Guard, they would just laugh at me. Ha, huh, that clever guy. They only come after me when I'm alone, so what's this? Who in the world would believe that a large man over 2 meters and 30 centimeters tall was the victim of constant stalking and assault? Minipin was just frustrated as he was worried about something for the first time in his life. Right then. Guild leader. The request details have arrived. The adjutant sent a bundle of documents in front of my eyes. This time the amount was slightly smaller. Only one sheet. Minfin narrowed his eyes. Have you received any requests even though it is the off-season? Yes what? 
they have been sending statements consistently for several days. It's the same person every time. At that time, Min Fin noticed something strange. This is because the condition of the request details that were sent every time was very bad. It must have been written on new paper, but it was badly crumpled. What? Isn't this a new request report? But why is it crumpled? I do not know. Every time you come here, you submit a crumpled request form and leave. I am the academy student I told you about back then. Academy? Who is that? Why is that there? A master from Colossio. He was sent back by the guild leader in the past after giving him a glass of milk. Ah. Only then did I remember. I remember having an outrageous client come and kick me out. Anyway. I have no intention of joining in with the deviant play of rich people. This time, Minnie Pin accepted the request statement without much thought and crumpled it up. Bushy. Right at that moment. The mini pin froze as if it had been struck by lightning. The sound of a request statement being crumpled is something I have heard many times before. Mini pin hurriedly moved both hands and opened the crumpled request form. And she crumpled again. Bushy. Because it is made of a special material, the crumpling sound is slightly different from other papers. This sound was clearly the very unpleasant noise made by a night intruder. Now that I think about it, why is that request statement, which I always crumpled up and threw away in the trash can in my office, back here? Min Fin turned to his adjutant and stammered a question. Yu Yu, are you cleaning my room these days? Yes. Sure. I do it every day. What about the room trash can? Did you empty it? I didn't empty it because it was empty every time. Mini Pin was shocked by the adjutant's words. This request statement was thrown in the trash can in the guild office room a few days ago. Then. Some crazy person sends out request details, then picks them up and keeps putting them back in the trash can. And they are attacking at night while shaking it. What the hell? What kind of idiot would do something crazy like this? Minipin opened the request details completely with a pale face. Request details. Name, Vakir. Affiliation, Colossio Academy. Request, hire one guide. Purpose, subdue monsters. The paper is so crumpled that you can't even see it anymore. When Minipin was looking at the request statement with a blank expression. How is it? An unfamiliar voice came from behind the adjutant. Behind the adjutant who was expressing his disapproval that he was not allowed to come in here, Minipin had a blank expression on his face. This is a warning. A first-year student at Colossio Academy. Vikir. Do you feel like taking on a request now? He was speaking in the same voice as the intruder from last night. Episode 229, Tuition, 5. A Night with a Bright Moon. Vikir quietly went out into the open air outside the ecliptic. Min Fin was driving the carriage next to Vikir. I President. What kind of monster are you trying to catch? Mini Pin, who had experienced Vakir's strength and temperament, was treating Vakir very cautiously. This was why he personally responded to Vakir's request to dispatch a guide. If I were to offend this crazy guy for no reason, I could lose a precious member of the guild, so I personally took responsibility for it. But Vakir didn't care much about Mini Pin's intentions. Even considering that I am a student at the academy, it is not a very strange monster if I catch it a lot. Aha! Minipin nodded at Vakir's words. Certainly, Vakir's strength was beyond that of a typical academy student. Where on earth did this monster come out? Minfin let out a small sigh. Meanwhile, Vakir was thinking a little differently next to him. It's a Minipin. He's definitely one of the talents I need to recruit to my side. He is the best guide. When the Age of Destruction arrived, he was one of the warriors who made a great contribution to the human allied forces. Most of the monster encyclopedias known to Vakir were created by him, and later, the research field called Monster Ecogeography was also founded based on his research. However, Mini Pin died early during the battle against the demons because there was no background to support him. A person who does not belong anywhere. What does that mean? 
the person who picks it up first is the owner. In this life, the life of the mini pin will be extended much longer. One day, the Baskervilles, who will be swallowed up by Vakir, will become his backers. There were times when I showed some of my power because I was planning on taking him under my command in the first place. Vakir briefly tested Min Fin, who would later rise to the ranks of heroes and soon become his confidant. Is there a monster that is suitable for a student to catch and that makes a decent income? Hmm. A monster that is not too strong but has good income that's just no. Dot. Play. A bizarre monster with the head of a hyena and the body of a dwarf. It is a low-level monster that walks on two legs and scatters dirty fur and a foul odor. They live in groups in the alpine areas on the outskirts of the imperial capital, and they have dug so many burrows underground that they have caused quite a problem, causing the ground to collapse. It is an entity that is increasingly dangerous as it not only interferes with civil engineering construction, but also attacks workers. Minipin indeed had a lot of knowledge about monsters. He generously passed on his extensive knowledge about monsters called Knolls to Vakir. Knolls have weak individual combat power, so even as a first-year academy student, you can kill a lot of them. Also, surprisingly, the fur is not only tough and soft, but also has good thermal insulation properties, so it is often used as rugs and covers. Bones and internal organs can also be sold as medicine to make money. But wouldn't selling them be as good as catching one powerful large monster? You don't know. Knolls are an ecologically disturbing species defined by the imperial family. You get a reward just for killing it. Then the story is different. Not only will you get a certain amount of reward per animal just by killing them, but if you can sell the skin, meat, and bones, you will kill two birds with one stone, and the income will be quite generous. So, how do you catch gnolls? Um, gnolls have a habit of collecting shiny objects. When encountered, the most common method is to scatter glass like beads to dazzle and kill them. But Vikir shook his head. That's a method you only use when you encounter a few gnolls. Yes, well, that's true. I will use a different method. The method Vakir chose was simple. Gnolls are attracted to the fresh blood of freshly killed animals. They have a good sense of smell, so they can smell something from several kilometers away and flock together. You're right. How do you know so well? Do they even teach you about that at the academy these days? What Vakir had just said was something that only experienced hunters would know, so Minipin looked quite surprised. They are the first to flock to prey that is wounded and smells of blood. Just like sharks in the sea, gnolls play a similar role on land. After killing a wild boar, Bakir cut off its throat and dragged its body from place to place. Blood seeps into the wet soil, and that fishy smell spreads throughout the forest on the night wind. Bakir wandered around, spreading wild boar hair and drops of blood all over the mountain. Of course, Min Fin, who had to follow him, couldn't help but be horrified. Hey, this is provoking the gnolls. It's suicidal. The danger level of individual individuals is only C+, but when they gather in groups, it goes up to grade A. The sight of all gnolls within several kilometers flocking towards this place would be a sight that a hunter would not even want to imagine. But Vikir just nodded with an indifferent expression. Don't worry. I'll just lure you in and then hide. Minipin felt a little relieved at those words. Oh, are you hiding? Thank God. Apparently, they have trouble concentrating when they are eating. Also, if competition for food occurs between groups, weak individuals will definitely be left behind, making it easier to select weak individuals that are easy to hunt. If we catch those who fell behind at that time one by one. However, Minipin couldn't help but be shocked once more by Vakir's next words. No, the one chasing is the leader. We will chase them wherever they lead their prey. Yes. Why? That's to figure out the location of the main base's cave. Vikir was targeting the entire colony, not just one or two gnolls or a group. Knoll hunting at the colony level, something that even the Empire's punitive forces could not do. Minipin half opened his mouth at Vikir, who said it so easily. Why, why are you doing this? And to Minipin, Vikir said a short word. It would be nice to make a lot of money. Soon, a group of gnolls came and picked up the boar's carcass. 
They cut open the boar's stomach, scraped out the still hot, steaming intestines, and then dragged the rest towards the low road between the bushes. Vikir and Minipin followed quietly behind him. Eventually, they were able to discover a large earthen cave hidden in the low hills. Minfin climbed on a high tree branch and looked around. Do you really think this is going to work? However, the visible scenery once again proved that Vakir's plan was a no-brainer. A flock of gnolls swarming around. Minipin was astonished when he saw the huge group of gnolls wandering around. President. This doesn't seem like a lot. The size of the colony is considerable. All the gnolls who were having trouble in the imperial court were gathered here. If you touch this place hastily, the gnolls will flood the nearby villages. Monster wave. If you make a mistake, there is a high possibility that you will end up committing the mistake of overthrowing. However. I'll have to look for other cave entrances connected to this cave. Vikir remained calm. Within a few hours, Vikir discovered several other cave entrances that were believed to be connected to the first cave. Minipin was impressed by Vikir's expert search skills, but he still had no idea what to do against so many gnolls. At that time, Vikir filled the mana and hit the earthen wall with his fist. Quack. Rumble. The piles of dried earth that formed the cliff collapsed, blocking the entrances to several caves. Vikir smiled bitterly as he remembered popping glasses of champagne at a club in the past. Now let's go to the cave at the top. Minifin followed Vikir's orders and drove the carriage toward the entrance to the cave at the top. Swish, wow. Several gnolls rushed at them, but their heads were cut off by Minipin's great sword. President. What to do now OMG? Minipin swallowed the wind. Vikir took out all the items that had been loaded into the carriage. It was oil. Vikir, who spent all his remaining money, bought all the used oil that had been stored in the academy to be discarded until its expiration date at a low price, and is now pouring it into the very top of the knoll's nest here. Gurgling. A bluish oil made from the fruits of the sabic tree hangs thickly inside the oyster. Kiang Kiang. Growling. Twisting. Loud murmuring sounds were heard from underneath the cave. A few gnolls came up to the top, but all of them fell back down into the burrows due to the minipin's knife. When dozens of oil drums were empty, Bakir kicked all the remaining oil drums into the cave. And. Grumble. The torch he was holding was also thrown into the deep cave. Quack. There was a loud explosion sound. At the same time, the sabic tree oil, which is highly flammable and has a low boiling point, began to heat up with a loud noise. Washishishishizik, jijijik popchik. The sound of the gnolls frying in oil that were not able to get out of the oyster is loud. The boiling oil continued to flow down the oysters, and the gnolls below were unable to avoid them and were being fried alive. Kik kik. Kai on. Wow. The gnolls in the upper layer are fried in oil, and even the gnolls in the middle layer are choking to death from the exhaust fumes. The gnolls in the lower level quickly tried to escape the cave, leaving behind the corpses of their comrades. However, since most of the cave entrances were already blocked by dirt, suffocation was inevitable. Oxygen concentration drops rapidly, and smoke and odor rise. Even the atmosphere heated up rapidly, and those that survived steamed to death at the entrance of the blocked earth tunnel. Min Fin just opens his mouth. It was his first time seeing someone hunting colony monsters in this way. However, Bikir maintained a calm attitude even in this situation. This loud strategy is effective when scaring monsters with low intelligence. In fact, pouring boiling oil into the entrance of the upper oyster has a strong performance nature. In reality, it couldn't cause that much damage. The real purpose is to scare the prey and confuse them. Wow. Pop. The burned gnolls are scared and crawl down to the bottom of the cave. Because of this, young and small gnolls or old gnolls that move slowly are trampled to death by their fellow gnolls. It was common for them to bite their companions to death as they tried to pass through narrow caves first. When there is chaos in the herd, only the strongest and fastest among them survive. And those who survived ran towards the entrance of the cave on the lowest level. Is it finally coming out? Towards the place where the last hound's eyes are shining. 
Episode 230 Tuition, 6. There was chaos in the forest that had been quiet just a moment ago. Don't fall in. Kusisisishik. Wasasasasasa. The screams of the gnolls being fried in oil were tearing up the night sky. The foul smell of a wild animal being burned alive flows out of the cave. Those who barely survived were completely devastated, with hot oil sticking all over their bodies. Gur. Gurgling. Kayang Kayang. Kaaza. The gnolls that came out of the cave, writhing in pain, were all showing their teeth and claws. A wounded beast has narrowed vision. That means there is nothing to see. Even though it was a dangerous C-plus rank monster, the killing power it unleashed while struggling was comparable to that of a higher rank monster. However. Phew. All those struggles were meaningless in Vakir's hands. The crude iron skewer quickly pierced the gnoll's neck. Really? The gnoll who was just coming out of the cave felt a stinging sensation on the side of his neck, but he was so helpless that he ran straight ahead without even thinking about looking to the side. But of course, because there was a hole in his neck, he was unable to stretch a few steps and ended up stumbling and sitting down. Thud. For a few seconds, a fountain of red blood spurts out from its neck, and the knoll falls limp on the spot, suffocating with bleary eyes. Bikir stayed close to the side of the cave and kept stabbing the necks of the knolls coming out of the cave with an iron skewer. Sigh. 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 There is no need to sting much. Just once. She stretched out and retrieved her arm with strength. Every time the iron skewer monotonously moves back and forth, the knolls that jump out of the burrow fall down and pile up in front. Soon, every single one of the knolls that jumped out of the cave turned into cold corpses and piled up in the empty space in front of the cave. Bikir roughly wiped the blood splattered from his face and then brushed his hair. It seems like it's almost over. A scene of terrifying slaughter. Minnie Pin, who was watching the killing technique unfolded without a single error and the incredible skill level, could not help but hold his tongue. What on earth do you do, boss? Why? Is this your first time catching gnolls? Of course it's my first time seeing you. Where is the person who catches gnolls like this? Even as Minnie Pin finished speaking, more than ten gnolls had already fallen out of the den. Minnie Pin collected the corpses of gnolls that continued to pile up in a specific spot and placed them on a cart. There are so many that it is clear that the carts they are pulling will not be able to handle them. It was to the point where I had to ask for cooperation from the government office or guild in a nearby town. And even at this moment, Bakir was waiting next to the cave. He dipped the skewer into the neck of the remnants of the gnolls that came out and pulled it out with lightning skill. Right then. Jarr. An unpleasant sound is heard from the cave. As soon as Minnie Pin heard that sound, he immediately shouted. Yes, boss. Avoid it. Something else is coming. Soon, something big came out of the cave. It was three times larger than a normal knoll, and unusually, its entire body was covered in black-green fur. The fur was as stiff as a needle, and sticky oil was dripping like tears from the bloodshot eyes. Minfin shouted in horror. This is a poison knoll, a variant of knolls. It has a danger level of a rank and its strength and speed are dozens of times that of an ordinary knoll. There is a deadly poison in the teeth, nails, and fur that can drive people crazy, so even if you just brush against it. But there was no time to explain. The poison knoll had suddenly burst out, breaking the entrance to a narrow cave. 8. Minipin ran towards Bakir with his great sword. 
this was to give the client in crisis time to escape. But. Yes. What looked like a lump of dust falling from above blocked Minipin's life-threatening lunge. Eh. Minipin stopped in place with a bewildered expression. That's because this small lump that looked like a butterfly that fell from the sky immediately rushed to the poison knoll in front of it as soon as it hit the ground. And what's even more surprising is that as soon as the vicious poison knoll was bitten by this small lump of dust on the back of its neck, it immediately rolled back its eyes, foamed at the mouth, and fainted. CR. The poison knoll flipped over and spewed out its contents through its mouth and anus, then completely stretched out. Ha. Huh. Min Fin looked at the corpses of Vakir and Poison Knoll in turn with a bewildered expression. What kind of monster is Poison Knoll? Once it appears, a small village in the mountains will be wiped out from that day. A named monster that was impossible to subdue even if several small and medium-sized hunting guilds attacked with all their might. He even has knolls around him as subordinates, so a large guild would have to mobilize elite troops to catch him. But. Good job, come back. When Vikir gestured, the dust ball flew out quickly and crawled into Vikir's sleeve. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. The baby madam was sticking out her tongue and giving me a look as if she was hoping for a compliment. Meanwhile. Minipin was just blinking, as if he couldn't believe that the small lump of fur in front of him, which he couldn't even tell was a living thing, had killed the poison knoll in one bite. Ha, I thought the past few days of being tormented by my boss were a nightmare now it feels more like a dream. Is something like this even possible? This is reality, so just estimate the compensation and the byproduct sales price. Minipin also nodded at Vakir's natural command. And Minipin had to hold out his tongue the entire time he was counting the countless corpses of gnolls and poison gnolls piled up in front of him. If you count the dead bodies in the cave, the number must be enormous. Even I can't figure it out right now. I think I need to go to a big city and get an appraisal from several experts. Since there is a compensation for each animal, I guess I will have to take care of all the corpses as well. Yes. Those that die from suffocation or have their necks pierced seem to be skinned and sold. I think it would be okay to just remove the bones and sell the ones fried in oil, but I'll go in and check later when the heat in the cave cools down. Because the heat was still rising inside the knoll's caves, Vakir and Minipin sat outside the knolls for a while and waited while collecting the bodies of the knolls. During this time, a few surviving knolls sometimes crawled out on notice and were sorted out at the Cub Madam line. Eventually, when the heat in the cave cooled down enough, Minfin crawled inside with a torch. As we dug out the ground and advanced little by little, we eventually saw an amazing sight in the deep cave. Yes, boss. I think you have to see this for yourself. Vikir, who heard Minipin's cry, also went into the cave. What awaited them inside was an unexpected sight that even the always calm Vikir was quite surprised by. Goldfinch. Gold coins soaked in oil and emitting golden light were piled up in the cave. Under the light created by the flickering torches, the gold coins cast an eerie light and shadow on both sides. It is true that a person freezes when suddenly exposed to too much wealth. What is all this? Minipin looked back at Vakir with a slightly frightened expression. But Vakir remained calm. It looks like someone was using this place as a safe. Yes. That's right ah. Minipin stopped speaking and let out an exclamation. As I said before, gnolls have a habit of collecting shiny things and piling them up in their burrows. There was a possibility that someone who took advantage of these knoll habits was storing black money here. There were a lot of knolls, so I wouldn't have had to get robbed by anyone else. Natural safekeeper. B but what kind of person on earth keeps his money in a knoll's nest? Well. But at least one thing is certain. At Vikir's words, Minipin tilts his head as if he is puzzled. And soon, his expression turned white as he heard Vikir's next words. He must be confident in killing all these gnolls and taking the gold back. A person capable of killing all the gnolls here as easily as opening a safe. Moreover, the size of the colony here is so large that there are even poison gnolls lurking around. Minipin trembled slightly and faced the gold coin in front of him. A huge number of gold coins are piled up like a mountain. Rattling. Vikir picked up a gold coin that had been thrown carelessly on the dirt floor. 
there is no serial number. A gold coin that has not yet had a serial number engraved on it. This means that it is an unregistered coin that has been created in a currency producing country but has not yet been officially distributed to banks. Bourgeois Damien, director of the Bureau of Coins and Manufacturers, enacted a law requiring unique serial numbers to be engraved on banknotes and coins. It seems like these coins were stolen before the law was enacted, or just before serial numbers were engraved. Are you saying these are all the result of robbing a bank? There is no explanation other than that. Vikir wondered if there had been any recent news about a bank being robbed. There is. There was. Recently, a being has been destroying major facilities in the imperial capital. Exclusive hounds of the night, about their ferocity. The night hound's evil deeds have gone too far the night hound that attacked the academy it is anti-human and anti-national meanwhile, during the festival, the major facilities in the imperial capital destroyed by the night hound's imperial imperial bank. I remembered it even better because it was an article written by Vakir himself. A villain who recently attacked the Imperial Bank and stole all the wealth inside. An unidentified terrorist who imitates the criminal behavior of night hounds and commits even greater crimes. The moment when Vakir remembers an unpleasant name. It casts an ominous shadow over reality. Something long and large fell in front of Vakir and Minipin, who quickly jumped out of the cave. Quack 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 quack. Vakir steps back due to the explosion of laughter that comes out of nowhere. When the dust settled, a long, curved scar was visible in the ground. A mark that looked as if a huge snake had crawled through it. It was a mark made by the strange man who was currently standing on a bare tree branch and looking down. Ho ho ho, are there rats crawling into my piggy bank? A modulated high-pitched voice is heard through the air hole in the mouth of the mask. And the moment he heard that voice, Minipin's face turned white. His expression was even more astonished than when he saw countless groups of gnolls. Me, Miss Uroboros. He encountered the worst villain who was terrorizing the Night of the Ecliptic. Episode 231 Tuition, 7. B, Mr. Vakir. That girl probably that woman, dot. Minnie Pin, a graduate level player, had his hands shaking slightly. This means that his senses are that sensitive and sharp. Skilled people recognize talented people. The higher the level of skill, the higher the level of understanding. So, Vikir also frowned as he looked at the woman in front of him. Ms. Uroboros. A villain whose true identity has never been discovered despite the fierce pursuit of the Imperial Guard, which is lined up with powerful men. In fact, the number of major facilities in the ecliptic she has destroyed so far is almost in the triple digits. But despite this, no one knows the identity of this villain. Even strength, skills, and main weapon. That was because all the witnesses had died or gone crazy. But you were right in your guess that she was a woman. Vikir, who recognized that his opponent was a formidable opponent, raised his spirits. Miss Uroboros had a quite unique appearance. A mask with two large snake scales sticking out like horns on a helmet with eyes twisted and torn like lightning patterns. Her entire body was covered in shiny black tights, and she wore a long cape and scarf. The abnormally high heels make her look even taller than before. He was holding a black whip in his hand, and I thought this was why it left a trace as if a snake had passed by. Ho ho ho, are there rats crawling into my piggy bank? A modulated high-pitched voice is heard through the air hole in the mouth of the mask. Miss Uroboros landed on the ground and raised her masked face to look at the Vakir. Moment. Miss Uroboros flinched slightly when she saw Vikir's face. Vikir narrowed his eyes. This is because Miss Uroboros changed the momentum she gave off from the moment our eyes met. Coo 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 coo. A terrifying, deadly force began to press down on the nearby dozen meters. Children who touch other people's piggy banks should be punished, right? At the same time, a whip flew out. Sigh, wow. The whip, which has numerous thorns like a rose vine, crushes the hard rock floor very easily. It was like hitting soft tofu with a club. The aura is dense. At least graduate level, maybe higher. Vikir was amazed at the unexpected inaction shown by Miss Uroboros. That black aura like boiling asphalt. At that level, even if he had joined the Imperial Army, he would have immediately attained the rank of high-ranking executive. 
If he had not reached master level due to his match with Camus this time, Bakir might have also reached a tight tie. After becoming a sword master, I have never once squeezed my power to its limit. Maybe it's a good opportunity. But now his face has been revealed, and he is Vakir, a first-year academy student. I don't know if he was in nighthound mode, but he couldn't fight with his face exposed like this. And that too, against one of the most dangerous people in the imperial capital. At that time, I heard Minipin whispering in a low voice. President. If you go down the foot of this mountain, you will find a government office. It is also patrol time under the jurisdiction of the Imperial Guard. It is quite dependable that he does not run away alone and takes care of his clients until the end. Bakir nodded to Minipin's advice and stepped back. Right then. Where are you going to take me out? Miss Uroboro's whip strikes again. Bakir quickly tilted his head to the side. Fit, wow. A sharp wind touches Bakir's left cheek. A black snake once again cut down all the trees next to it. Miss Uroboro's whip had a sharp tip like an awl, so it could stab like a spear or cut like a knife. The sides, which can be cut even if you avoid the sharp end, are long and stubbornly coiled, making it very annoying. Even the tips of the thorns growing out of the whip seem to be coated with a strong poison. Um. I guess it would be difficult to just run away. Bakir continued to retreat with a frown on his face. Miss Uroboros's momentum became more and more vicious as she flung her body upward and downward several times to avoid the point where the whip was twisted and tightened. Ho, oh, look at this. There was a part of you that believed this. You were hiding your skills, you insidious thing. Miss Uroboros made the aura on her whip grow even bigger. Clap clap quack quack quack. The power of Miss Uroboros that turns everything into a wasteland. The momentum was like a one-man army. The whip filled with aura spun in an infinite trajectory like Uroboros snake, and soon took the shape of a sphere surrounding Miss Uroboros body. Don't fall in. Everything that touches the sphere of aura is torn to pieces and shattered. Wow. Except one. Miss Uroboros was embarrassed when she saw her whip bend in the air at some point and bounce off. A whip is basically a weapon that is difficult to handle and a scary object that can even harm its owner if it loses control. Puff. Miss Uroboros' whip was caught in the empty air and soon twirled around in vain. Because of that, Miss Uroboros almost got hit by her own whip. What is this? She tilts her head as if she doesn't understand. But Vikir just quietly shook off his left sleeve. Good job. But don't come forward next time. Because it's dangerous. Nuclear nuclear, sigh. On Vikir's wrist, Madam Baby was snoring with an angry expression. Currently, around Miss Uroboros, the transparent wires that Madam Baby had placed were tightly drawn. At the same time, the baby Madam began to emit a black poisonous dance, blocking Miss Uroboros' vision. What? Why is there such an unpleasant fog suddenly? When Miss Uroboros waved her hand in front of her eyes as if she was annoyed. President. Now. Surprisingly, Minfin picked up a knife. He mustered all his strength, infused the sword with aura, and slashed with all his might. However, because it was a blow from Graduator, Miss Uroboros had no choice but to raise her whip to block it. And. Vikir took out his bow towards the gap. Black Bow Anubis. The end beam, which was split into five pieces, and the five strings were pulled taut all at once. It shot out toward the enemy in front, drawing a black trajectory. Miss Uroboros quickly retrieved the whip, but her speed was slowed by Madam Baby's webs that were all over the forest. Puff puff puff. Four arrows were broken by the whip, but only one arrow flew on the right track. Hmm. While Vikir was casting his next arrow on the string, he discovered something strange. One of the arrows fired just now grazed the left side of Miss Uroboros' face. A person as skilled as Miss Uroboros could definitely see and dodge the attack, but for some reason, she was a little slow to react to attacks coming from the left. The same thing happened when I alternately shot right and left again. A subtle difference that would not have been noticed unless you were a person of considerable skill. Is there a blind spot over there? Vikir lifted Anubis and launched a curveball towards the left side of Miss Uroboros' body. 
Arrows curved in a parabolic curve persistently aim at the left side of Miss Uroboro's face. This guy again. He even brought a strange bow. And the more this happened, the more and more the anger Miss Uroboros showed, the cause of which was unknown. Right then. Peace. The night sky suddenly became brighter. I saw red fireworks being shot off, creating a bright pillar of light. Mini pin. He ran to the carriage and fired the signal that hunters usually set off in times of distress. Miss Uroboros gritted her teeth and turned her head. Vikir's skills, with the black fog that had been blooming earlier, unidentified wires, and a strange bow, were at a level that could not be considered that of a first-year academy student. Miss Uroboros was enraged by Vikir's skill in hitting and running away like a hunter who had lived in the forest for decades. But. What? What is this roaring sound? I thought a hunter was in trouble, it doesn't seem like something out of the ordinary. The ground shakes even hundreds of meters away. Call for assistance immediately. Stop marching. We're ready for battle now. The military flags felt at the bottom of the mountain were clearly approaching in the direction from which the signal flares were fired. Coincidentally, it seemed like a unit of the Imperial Army was marching nearby. Ho ho ho, bad luck. Miss Uroboros retrieved her whip in an annoyed manner. He then sent a harsh gaze towards Bakir, who had widened the distance in front of him. Well, okay. There must be another connection with you. She touched the left side of her face covered by the mask with her hand. Then, in the blink of an eye, it kicked off the ground, flew up, stepped on tree branches, and disappeared. He left as quickly as he showed up. Yes, boss. Are you okay? Mini Pin, who had whistled to inform the Imperial troops of their location, ran towards Vakir out of breath. Vakir just nods his head, still looking calm. Signal flare. The timing was good. You're welcome. It was fortunate that we had some spares in the wagon. After seeing Minipin's embarrassed smile, Bakir turned his head and looked at the forest again. The forest at night became quiet as if it had never been so noisy. The sound of tree branches and leaves swaying in the wind. Miss Uroboros, who has melted into the thick darkness, is no longer visible. However, the only things left at the scene were, as usual, marks on the floor that looked like a large snake had crawled through them. Episode 232, Tuition, 8 Vikir received satisfactory answers from several appraisers introduced by Minipin. Most of them are low class. The bodies were badly damaged because they were burned or stuck in boiling oil. However, since the quantity is so large, the number of prizes is also considerable. As the price of playing is expensive these days, the total sales price is likely to be quite high. Do you have a sales channel in mind? If you don't have one, we can introduce you to a good distribution channel. Appraisers appraise the corpses of gnolls piled up in a vacant lot and set prices based on the condition of their skin, bones, internal organs, meat, etc. 1. The highest quality is those with intact skin, meat, internal organs, and bones. 2. As long as the leather is in good condition, it is a premium product. 3. Even if the skin is damaged, if the meat or internal organs are intact, it is intermediate grade. 4. The skin, meat, and internal organs are damaged, but the bones can still be removed. The corpse of a knoll is an object of dissection that is welcomed with open arms by all monster research institutes in the imperial capital. Even taxidermists sometimes buy the corpses of large knolls unconditionally. This is because it is good to use as an introduction when teaching beginners. Leather is highly durable and soft to the touch, so it is in great demand, and meat and intestines are also used for food, feed, and fertilizer. Some special parts of Nal's meat are loved by gourmets because they taste similar to top-quality beef. If you sprinkle Nal intestines in a fish farm or orchard, you can expect more abundant results than applying any artificial feed or fertilizer. Bones tended to be processed into medicine or ancestral rites. Because Vikir fried them with boiling oil, the skin, meat, and internal organs of the dead gnolls were mostly damaged. However, because there were so many gnolls, many gnolls left intact corpses, and no matter how damaged the corpses were, the bones, teeth, and claws were still intact, so they could be sold for a fairly reasonable price. 
Of course, it was a fairly small amount compared to the price after processing, but it was quite a generous amount considering that not only could the process of gathering, transporting, and sorting these items be omitted, but also that one did not have to deal with retailers trying to negotiate the price. What's more, it's even better that the government has even given us a reward. That's awesome. This was the general opinion of Minipin, who had been sticking close to Vakir's side ever since that night and not wanting to let go. In the process of subduing a large colony of gnolls, he must have been impressed by Vakir's resourcefulness, so he personally took care of all sorts of miscellaneous tasks, from selling knoll corpses to receiving compensation. Vikir also saw the loyalty that Minipin showed in a close match with Miss Uroboros, so he could trust and leave everything to her. Minfin said as he loaded the Knoll skins onto Vikir's cart. You can sell all of Knoll's byproducts to the guild, but I recommend looking for a separate sales channel for leather. In particular, in the case of poison Knoll leather, it seems like a good idea to personally auction it off. Then it would be better to take it to the academy. Vikir nodded and answered. Colossio's Academy rents warehouse land under a preservation spell at a low rent only to current students. Also, various auctions are held at the Thrifty Bazaar held on the last day of every month, making it a perfect place to sell items. It is said to be an affordable bazaar, but as it is a large-scale auction officially licensed by the Empire, it will be easy to dispose of the leather skins. Um. The Bazaar of Colossio. I think it's a good way. No leather has many uses. It has good thermal insulation and good tactile feel, so it is good for adding armor to armor in the winter, and its toughness and elasticity make it useful as a knot or decoration for a scabbard. Also, since it changes color when exposed to poison, it can also be used as a reagent material. I happen to be a member of a newspaper club, so I could place an ad in the corner of the newspaper. Vikir planned to return to the academy and sell all the knoll and poison knoll pelts. Meanwhile, Minipin looked disappointed. Are you going back to the academy? The skills that Vakir showed during this hunt were so incredible that it was hard to believe that he was a first-year undergraduate student at the academy. Is that why? Minifin seemed to have decided that she would like to continue working with Vakir. But he had no idea. Vakir has no intention of letting go of Minipin. Hey, Minfin. Vakir called Minpin in a soft voice. When Minipin looked away, Vikir asked vaguely. Your family situation doesn't look that good. Are your wife and daughter okay? Daljigu. Minipin's expression darkened slightly at Vikir's words. You're right. In fact, it is very difficult to start a guild these days due to financial difficulties. However, it is not possible to let go of family members who have worked for a long time. Why are you having such trouble with someone of your level of skill? It looks like there are many skilled guides and porters in the guild. All hunting guilds are like that these days. We have to pay close attention to the large mercenary guilds. It's natural to feel sad if you don't have someone to support you. After finishing speaking, Minipin smiled bitterly and continued. Hee hee, this is all my fault. If I hadn't made the mistakes I made when I was young, I wouldn't have been in such financial straits. Mistake. When Vikir asked, Minipin nodded after some hesitation. When I was young, I had great ambitions. So, to make that dream come true, I contacted brokers, I got scammed and lost all my money. You were scammed by brokers? Yes. It's a shame, but it is. It put her wife through a lot of trouble at that time. I still feel sorry. I also feel guilty about my daughter. By the way, I'm going to start school next year and I'm already worried about the cost of education. What was your dream that made you try to get through brokers? When Vikir asked, Minipin scratched the back of his head and answered in a remorseful voice. That, actually, I wanted to join the Baskervilles. Vikir's eyes widened slightly at the unexpected words. Minfin continued speaking. A family that subdues monsters on the Western Front. Iron-blooded swordsmen. How cool is that? And if you become a member of the Baskerville family, won't you be taught the invincible Baskerville style of swordsmanship? I gave her a house and land, and I thought that was the only way to help her become better. Of course, everything went to waste because I was scammed by brokers. Hmm, really? Vikir lightly brushed his chin with his fingers. 
the thoughts I had from the beginning became even stronger. Vikir asked finally. Hey. Yes. You know very well about the ecology of monsters, right? Things like habits or the location of the nest. Sure. When I was young, I traveled all over the continent as a member of an exploration guild. Do you know much about the monsters on the Western Front? Of course. It is possible to distinguish between subspecies, variants, subspecies, and superspecies. After hearing Minipin's answer, Bakir nodded as if he was satisfied. I'll be calling you again soon. Colossio Academy's Admissions Office and Scholarship Foundation Professor Banshee was filling out documents with a very annoyed expression. It seems like I do all the academy work myself. The documents piled up like a mountain in front of me were all related to scholarships and tuition. At that time. Knock knock. A knock was heard outside the office door. Please come in. At the same time as Professor Banshee's voice, a familiar face appeared. It was Dolores, the student council president. Professor Banshee really disliked her because she showed up and made annoying comments just when the scholarship budget was being spent. What did you come to nag me about again? This is an agenda for students who are excluded from receiving scholarship benefits. Dolores presented new documents in front of Professor Banshee. Students who cannot attend next semester due to disadvantaged family circumstances. Among them, there were detailed stories of students who were unable to manage their grades because they were working part-time jobs to pay for tuition, or students who were unable to manage their grades and work part-time jobs to receive scholarships. The student who worked part-time ultimately failed to save up tuition in time, and the student who studied ended up not receiving a scholarship due to poor grades. Due to complicated family circumstances, there were students who were actually disadvantaged but could not receive scholarship benefits on paper. Dolores spoke calmly. Some students who did not receive scholarships require re-evaluation. On the other hand, there are students who have received scholarships who need to be re-evaluated. In reality, there were a significant number of people who were born into wealthy families and lived well, but on paper they pretended to be from poor families and received false scholarships. She was now reporting this same fact. However, the documents Dolores submitted were all neat and well-presented forms, but to Professor Banshee, they were just luggage that needed to be handled while working extra overnight shifts. Scholarships are paid according to school regulations. Those are the rules that you must keep and protect as the student council president. I'm asking you to take another look at the underprivileged students that the school rules miss out on. Are you asking me to work twice now? As the student council president, I have a duty to speak out for students' grievances. Then who will take responsibility for my hardship of having to work twice? Would you please double my pay? Professor Morg Banshee. Today is the deadline for tuition payment. Please listen to the voices of students one more time. What do the school rules tell me to do about that? Professor Banshee and Dolores engage in a war of words without any hesitation. However, as time passed, Dolores's spirit was gradually weakened by Professor Banshee's ironclad attitude. Right then. Bang. The door burst open without knocking. Vikir. He strode into Professor Banshee's office. Naturally, Professor Banshee, who originally hated Vikir, frowned. Mr. Vikir. Are you now slamming the door open and coming in without knocking? I guess you didn't receive proper home education from your father. Yes. It was a defeat for Professor Banshee, who failed to discern that Bakir had a fairly strong immunity to Padrip. Professor Banshee crossed his arms as if he was very uncomfortable. Okay. Did you know that today is the deadline for paying tuition? He was thinking deep down that Bakir would not be able to afford the tuition. I heard that Bakir brought a lot of knoll skins from somewhere. However, Professor Banshee had also obtained another rumor related to this. Among the students, two groups, the nobles and the nobles, declared that they would keep the Vikir army in check, right? There are two major forces in the bazaar of Colossio Academy. The noble faction was formed by elites from noble families, and the noble faction was formed by elites from noble families. Now that these two groups have decided to keep Vikir in check, there is no way that the goods exhibited at the bazaar will receive the right price. 
So, Professor Banshee thought deep down that it would not be easy for Vakir to raise tuition. I don't know where they got so much leather as long as it's a product and not cash, it's not money if you can't sell it. But. Professor Banshee's predictions were spectacularly wrong. Thud. Vakir placed a heavy sack on Professor Banshee's desk. Surprisingly, the large sack was full of banknotes and gold coins. It was a truly enormous amount of money, with a lot more left over even after paying four years' worth of tuition in one go. Professor Banshee and Dolores look at the gold coins spilling out on the desk with surprised expressions. Vikir, standing in front of him, opened his mouth with his characteristic expressionless face. It even goes to my friends who couldn't pay their tuition. Episode 233, Tuition, 9 Colossio Academy's Thrifty Bazaar boasts a huge scale that belies its cute name. Students auction off their used items at low prices, and sometimes some students even offer things they made or collected themselves, or unidentified antiques brought from their respective families. The scale of this bazaar is large enough to be considered one of the top ten auctions in the empire, and even people outside the academy can participate in the auction, attracting the attention and foot traffic of countless people. And in this huge bazaar, two great forces coexisted. These are the aristocratic faction and the barbarian faction. First of all, the aristocratic faction was formed by students from prominent aristocratic families. It is a group where the elites, including the seventh great family or their maternal relatives and collaterals, hold real power. On the other hand, the noble faction, formed by elites from noble families, also boasted a prestige comparable to that of the noble faction. If the noble faction was a small elite and strictly their own league, the barbarian faction consisted of people from the Toho family, famous for agriculture and commerce, or successors to famous mercenary guilds, or successors to large-scale mines or shipyards. These two reign as powerful figures within the school and continue to increase its size and power by recruiting talented juniors under their command. This power structure becomes a strong network and system that continues even after graduation, and eventually encompasses the political and financial world of the empire. And this year's first-year student who was first targeted by the nobles and the nobles, the two groups that secretly ruled the school, was Vakir. Although it wasn't when he entered school, he was a talented person who stood out in the midterm exam over time. Since he is a single person with no stomach behind him, he is perfect for flirting. In order to take this talented first-year student under their command, the noble faction and the noble faction had actually been secretly working behind the scenes for a very long time. But Vakir never once lived up to their expectations. At most, the letters I sent were chewed up without being read, and no matter how hard I tried to visit and talk to him, I could never see his face. At best, they tried to show force by sending out female students from the second and third grades who were said to be pretty and sent out fighters who were said to be good-looking women, but to no avail, both the nobility and noble factions were in a state of anger. Whoa, Bakir, I think you need to give this arrogant junior a pat on the bridge of his nose. We should give him his worth before he comes under us. Ironically, the nobles and nobles joined hands to suppress each other. In the short term, Bakir has become a public enemy. When the nobles and nobles were plotting to overpower Bakir, Bakir participated in the frugal bazaar at the right time. That guy, he's trying to get tuition money. It's no leather. It happened to be a necessary ingredient. Should I try to hit the price right now? Anyway, I'm sure I got a chance to meet the hunting guild and get a share of it, but I don't know if I know the market price properly. That's right, they said they won't accept anyone from that hunting guild. The students of the aristocratic and noble factions were planning to flatten Vakir's nose through this auction. And when the auction began, no one really wanted to buy Vakir's Noel Hyde. This is because students from the aristocratic and noble factions threatened other students in advance. The barbarian and aristocratic students giggled behind the quiet auction hall and imagined Vakir's soon-to-be-dead face. But. Noel leather is a useful item, so I thought there would be a lot of people who covet it. It's not as popular as I thought. Vikir shrugged and turned his head to look at the mountain of Noel hides piled up on the auction house stage. Aha! Is it because there are too many? At the same time, Vikir did something that shocked both the nobles and the nobles. Grumble! He seemed to have lit a torch on the spot and ignited the Noel leather on the stage. Everyone was astonished and stood up in their seats or not, 
but the Kir silently burned all the knoll skins in front of them. Crackle. Pop. Gurgling. About half of the knoll skins that were piled up on the stage were burned in vain. A strange silence fell within the auction house. In this frozen atmosphere, Bakir briefly asked. Is it still too much? At the same time, Bakir drew fire once more. Bakir did not put out the fire until the remaining knoll skins were reduced by half again. At this point, unrest began to arise among the students. This is because null leather was an essential research material for students. But Vikir was relentless. As there was still hesitation and no one came forward to buy it, Vikir picked up the torch once again. It was a gesture without the slightest hesitation, as if he wanted to burn it all down. Then, the people who were watching became angry and blocked Vikir. That's something to prepare for the next class. Me, I want to live. I'm not ready yet. I also needed some extra armor ahead of the cold weather performance evaluation. There are already very few items for sale. Bye. I'll live. Overbidding. You crazy guy. Live. I'm living. Stop burning. In such a situation, Bakir spoke firmly. The minimum bid price is four times the first auction price. It's a request to pay for the loss caused by a trivial war of nerves. In the end, the students had no choice but to pay the price by crying and eating mustard to Vakir, blaming the nobles and the nobles. Of course, the students from the aristocratic and noble factions were dumbfounded. So. That's how the auction ended. Professor Banshee asked in astonishment. Vakir nodded calmly. Yes. Thanks to you. I was able to pay all of my tuition fees. I'm afraid those words will end. Pop. Pop. The tough leather bag placed on the desk tore with a loud noise. Soon, the bills and gold coins inside began to fall to the floor with a loud noise. Jangle jangle jangle. Professor Banshee's desk was instantly covered with money. He muttered quietly as he looked down at the large, sturdy leather bag with so much money that the sides were bursting open. I'm going to need some change. Professor Banshee took a pair of reading glasses out of his pocket, placed them on the tip of his nose, and then, with delicate movements of his fingers, pulled out several large gold coins. This is the end of your tuition. Ah, for years worth all at once. All in one lump sum. Professor Banshee shrugged as if wondering what to do with the remaining money. But Vikir didn't seem to have any intention of collecting the change. The rest is also tuition. I have too much money left over to call it tuition. Are you thinking of buying the lecture building? If you are aiming for a professorship rather than a student position, please use the rest for high school students who cannot afford tuition. Professor Banshee looked blank at Vikir's words. And even Dolores, who was standing next to him. I guess I heard wrong just now, right? Yes. Are you saying you're going to donate this entire amount to a scholarship foundation? In the name of a scholarship? Yes. Instead, there are conditions. At Vikir's words, Professor Banshee twisted his mouth with an expression that said, of course. There are often. There are cases where people with a lot of money donate a large amount of money to a scholarship foundation and then profit from it. Usually, the main purpose is to obtain invisible benefits such as tax deductions, donations receive greater tax benefits than any other expense treatment, expanding influence within the school by creating a positive image, and further creating a political group or increasing power. However, the conditions presented by Vakir were again beyond Professor Banshee's expectations. In order to receive this money, the condition is that you must complete a certain number of hours of volunteer work at the orphanage. Nursery School Professor Banshee frowned as if he didn't understand. If you can receive a scholarship by volunteering at an orphanage, it will be a great deal. This is a very grateful offer for high school students who have to focus on part-time jobs and scholarships. In other words, it was no different from saying that they would just pay the tuition for free. For the next decade or so. What on earth is this plan? Professor Banshee scanned Vakir's entire body with a questioning expression. However, Professor Banshee was the first to raise his hands as Vakir showed no reaction no matter how hard he stared. Okay. 
I understand. Let's create a separate award on campus and award scholarships in that name. Do you have something in mind for the name of the award? In response to Professor Banshee's question, Bakir remained silent for a moment. Then Professor Banshee waved his hand as if he couldn't be bothered to listen any further. I guess there isn't one. Then I'll just call it, Bakir Award. The students who receive this award will be very grateful to you. It's like meeting a wealthy sponsor and being lucky enough to receive free tuition. You must be very famous. At that time, Vikir raised his hand to stop Professor Banshee. Please keep the donor's name anonymous. And the name of the award will be something different. Professor Banshee adjusts his glasses and looks up. You can donate a huge amount of money and remain anonymous. Then you can't get tax deductions or gain fame, right? Professor Banshee's belief that all humans act only for their own benefit was being directly denied. However, whether Professor Banshee was confused or not, Bakir opened his mouth with the same expressionless expression, but in a slightly lowered voice. The statue will be named Nymphet. After hearing those words, Professor Banshee frowned as if he didn't understand what was happening. Step. Dolores, who was listening to this entire conversation from the side, only slightly wavered her eyes. Episode 234, Doubt, 1. Student Council President Dolores Rune Quo Vadis. She had a strange feeling when she heard that the aristocratic and noble factions, which were a thorn in the side of the Student Council, had been greatly affected by the thrifty bazaar incident. Unlike the Student Council, which is an official organization and exercises power in sunny areas of the school, the noble and noble factions mainly formed their power in the shadows of the school. While the student council carried out its duties in accordance with legitimate school rules and procedures, the aristocratic and noble factions were using personal connections, favors, and insider information to increase their power. So, the student autonomy power on campus was divided into the student council, the noble faction, and the noble faction, but Dolores did not like them very much because they always enjoyed extraterritorial rights, avoided responsibility as an official organization, and only enjoyed the advantages of an unofficial organization. However, since it was the student council that had to collect public opinion and establish policies accordingly, the aristocratic faction and noble faction that led the flow of public opinion were always annoying opponents that had to be watched closely. And they drank the water. To one individual, a first-year student named Vikir. The noble faction and the noble faction, which had been secretly expanding their power to a level comparable to that of the student council, lost a lot of respect due to this incident, which caused many defectors. Weakening the political enemy is the same as strengthening it. Many people who were disappointed with the aristocratic and noble factions turned away, and some even joined the student council. So the executives in the student council were smiling every day. Vikir, shall we recommend that friend to our student council? That's right. Who would refuse the student council's gold badge? Wow, that guy has succeeded. He became a student council executive candidate starting in his first year. Maybe I could aim for the youngest student council president. Oh, that was too over the top. Not even the student council president. Still, it's amazing. Anyway. The nobles and nobles will harass him and try to recruit him at the same time, so we have to move quickly. It was so bad that they had already selected Vikir as a candidate for an executive position starting from the second year. However, Dolores thought that Bakir would not accept the invitation to join the student council, let alone an executive position. If you were an ordinary first-year student, you would jump up in joy when you heard that you would be appointed as a student council officer, there's something different about him. No, actually, it went to another level. The fact that he went out and collected a huge amount of knoll skins and donated all the proceeds from selling them to a scholarship foundation for high school students is also unusual. Moreover, in the process, he had the guts to embarrass the nobles and nobles. No leather is not an incredibly rare item, but it is still quite valuable. Burning them in front of the enemy and then raising the price and bargaining. No matter how much I think about it, this isn't the courage of a first-year freshman. Dolores became curious about the person named Vikir. He is a junior who has been attracting attention since the beginning of the semester because he received a strangely high number of penalty points. And because of the sincerity shown at the daycare center and the kindness shown in resolving the disaster that occurred during a drinking game, I was paying a lot of attention to it now. 
and it turns out that I ranked first in both the written and practical exams on the midterm exam. A student who studies well, has good skills, and, moreover, is a very conscientious student. It was a pity that we could have become closer friends if the newspaper club I belonged to had not written a harsh article criticizing the Nighthound. And now. Dolores was feeling both a little bit fond of and curious about the cure's actions, which gave a blow to the nobles and the nobles. That feeling became even stronger after watching the conversation between Vikir and Professor Banshee just yesterday evening. The statue will be named Nymphet. Dot. Professor Banshee couldn't understand what Vikir said, but Dolores could sense it right away. Nymphet. A poor child who was sacrificed in the fight against Dantalian. Vikir still remembered that Nymphet. Aren't you being too kind to the kid? Did you get a kiss? I didn't receive it. It's not, not, it's in. The kid wants a kiss like that, so get some. I'm embarrassed. Dolores recalled a conversation she had with Vikir during her last volunteer work at the orphanage. Vikir had refused the Nymphet's kiss because he was embarrassed. Maybe it's because of the memories of that day that I can't forget the Nymphet even more. If so, Vikir must be hiding a warm heart beneath his blunt exterior. No, Dolores was sure that would be the case. Jump up. Dolores quickly got up from her seat. When my thoughts reached this point, I became anxious for some reason. I felt like I needed to meet Bakir right now and tell him something. It is probably due to a sense of responsibility and debt as the person who watched the Nymphet's last days with the Night Hound in the fight against Dantalian, as well as some unprecedented emotions that she herself is not aware of. Uh. Chairman, where are you going? Is there anything urgent? The agenda for today's meeting is. The student council executives look back with puzzled expressions. I'm sorry everyone. I will handle the agenda even if it means staying up all night. Dolores bowed her head in apology and quickly walked out the door. She left the lecture building and headed to the dormitory building. This is because most students are there around this time. But Vikir was not so easy to meet. Vikir. He is the last to come into the dormitory. Wouldn't you be in the library by now? Because I'm a study bug. It's not in the library. Hmm, then I guess I'll be in the weight room. Brother, it seems like you're working out a lot, look at your body. Yes. It's not in the library or the gym. Then maybe. I asked people like Tudor and Sancho Sinclair who were close to Vakir, but there was no way to guess his whereabouts. Even if you look at the entry registers at the front and back gates, there is no mention of them leaving, so they must be somewhere in the academy. Where on earth are you? Dolores took a breath and stood up. This is what I felt at the orphanage in the past, but Vikir is really good at moving around somewhere. Come to think of it, when an unidentified warlock appeared during the festival, his traces were unknown. A student who is shrouded in mystery and doubt about everything. Dolores felt her doubts about Vikir growing more and more intense. Even when I happened to be nearby and tried to smell the soul, I couldn't find anything. Vikir was much more closed-minded than other people his age, so there was no way to check. Suddenly, Dolores thought of Vikir's penalty points record. It doesn't make sense to accumulate so many penalty points because you took a wrong turn. Such a smart kid. I didn't know it at the time, but it's strange to think about it now. I couldn't help but think that Vakir may have collected penalty points with some intention. Dolores opened the chart recorded on the mana stone and took a closer look at Vakir's penalty points record. Vakir life attitude score, point deduction factors. Use of the emergency exit on the third grade floor of the dormitory building, one point. Entry to the fourth grade exclusive area of the training center, one point. Use the central staircase on the first floor of the Deadly Poison Experiment Building, one point. Entering the smoking area of the Experimental Monster Breeding Facility, one point. Use the central staircase on the sixth floor of the Professor's Lab, one point. Use the central staircase on the third floor of the Dedicated Training Room for Fever Donation, one point. Entry to the Fitness Room outside of Available Hours, one point. Entry into no-go area for non-officials next to the food warehouse at the cafeteria, one point. These places. If you look closely, you can see that they are sorted by date. Given the location, what will be the route of movement? 
Dolores decided that it wouldn't be a good idea to find Vakir today anyway, so she decided to follow Vakir's movements so far. Why? The purpose was to understand whether an ordinary first-year student would have received penalty points for going to a place where he would never set foot. And Dolores, who visited all the places listed in the demerit point record, discovered strange things in common among these places. A dark, high place. All of them were places facing the high barriers of the academy. Dolores looked around. What? Were you planning on crossing the walls of the academy? Otherwise, why did you only choose these places to go to? It is a series of increasingly incomprehensible situations. Right then. Tiring. A notification sound was heard from the mana stone. Dolores hastily turns it on. The Cure Life Attitude Score, Point Deduction Factors. Use of Emergency Exit on the Rooftop of the First Year Dormitory Building, 1 Point. A notification appeared that Vakir's penalty points had been updated. It was just a few seconds ago. This means that Vakir went up to the roof of the dormitory and was caught by the housemaster and received a penalty point. You were there. Dolores remembered that the rooftop of the dormitory building was also a dark and high place. Dolores started running with all her might, wondering why she was only looking for places like this. Eventually, she was able to reach the rooftop of the first year dormitory building. But there was already no one there. It seems that both Vakir and the housemaster who penalized Vakir have already left their seats. If you were in the dormitory building, it means you headed to your room, right? Dolores hurriedly came down from the emergency exit, received permission from the housemaster, and went to the room where Vakir was staying. But Vakir could not be found there either. I only met Piggy, who was studying in his room. Vakir. You just came in and left again. Yeah, really? Do you even know where you went now? I said I was going to the shower. But why? As soon as Dolores heard Piggy's answer, she was about to leave the door, but stopped for a moment. This is because I realized too late that if the place was a shower room, I wouldn't be able to meet him even if I went there. After your shower, you'll come back to your room, right? Well. Whenever evening comes, Bakir wanders around. Are there times when you don't come in? There is no such time. Even if it's late, he always comes home. Dolores nodded at Piggy's words. Suddenly, her eyes turned to where Vakir was staying. Old wooden desk. Thin sheets and worn pillows. A cheap matrix that looks like a few springs are missing. It was a simple life that would be hard to imagine anyone living there. Piggy's ordinary bedding above looks as luxurious as the Emperor's. Piggy felt Dolores' gaze and smiled awkwardly. Vikir doesn't usually put a lot of luggage in his room. It's like he's always going to leave. Leave? No, no. It's just my feeling, though. It seems a bit like that to my roommate. Dolores' expression became serious after hearing Piggy's words. Around that time, the housemaster in charge of the men's dormitory warned Dolores. It was a warning not to stay too long on the lower class, especially the male floor. In the end, Dolores had no choice but to turn away without meeting Bakir. Okay. Anyway, thanks Piggy. See you again. Yes. When Bakir returns, I will tell him that the chairman has visited. Dolores left the room after giving Piggy a polite greeting. As I looked back several times. And. Piggy, who was left alone in the room, witnessed this amazing situation and muttered quietly to herself. No way, the student council president Vakir. It was a very understandable misunderstanding. Episode 235, Doubt 2 The next morning. Early hours before the first period class starts. Dolores visited the newspaper club club room. Maybe it's because I couldn't sleep all morning yesterday because I had to deal with student council agenda, but the dark circles under my eyes are no joke. I have a lot of work to do because of the National College League next week. Should I keep vigil today too? Colossio. Magic Tower. Varangian. Themyscira. As the annual event jointly held by the four most famous high-ranking academies throughout the empire was approaching, all official organizations of the Colossio Academy were busy. 
Of course, the same was true for the student council, of which Dolores was the president. But despite working all night, her eyes were now burning with enthusiasm. I'm going to finish my club work in the morning today and go to lecture. And since the lectures lasted until the afternoon class, I went to visit Bakir in the meantime. Dolores vigorously opened the door to the club room and entered. Good morning everyone. This is the morning greeting from Dolores, who is always lively. But. The attitude of her classmates, who would normally have greeted her with cheerful smiles, was strange. Everyone was looking at Dolores with strange, smiling expressions. Spring is now coming to our Dolores too. Romance with a younger man, that's cool. She's younger our Dolores is in a higher grade, but she's younger. Anyway. My junior and I are a campus couple, I'm jealous, I'm jealous. You don't even tell us. It's really too much. Do I need to know about my best friend's love life through a newspaper article? Dolores just blinks and blinks at the criticism from her third grade classmates. Yet. Dolores saw a newspaper article presented in front of her. It was an externally published newspaper and was an exclusive article reported by a reporter from another newspaper who had infiltrated the academy. Exclusive A Spring Day of Youth for the Student Council President of Colosio Academy. Dolores Rune Quavadis, known as the Student Council President of Colosio Academy, was recently revealed to be in a relationship. Miss Dolores was not only skilled in literature and martial arts, but also attracted public attention from the beginning of her school because of her beautiful appearance. Surprisingly, the opponent was Group B, a freshman two years younger than me. Group B has been attracting attention from the beginning of his school year with his outstanding appearance, grades, and athletic ability. The feelings between the two that are presumed to have sprouted during the volunteer work. After a passionate courtship from both Dolores, it appears that their relationship was successful. The Quo Vadis family has not yet released any position on this. Meanwhile, the citizens of the imperial capital who heard about Dolores's love life responded with things like, it's nice to see her, she's a handsome man and woman, and I'm jealous, but it's okay as long as Dolores is happy. What is this? Dolores gaped. Recently, I thought that the number of paparazzi that seemed to come in from outside had increased significantly. Could it be that they were reporting on me? Third-year classmates gathered around Dolores, standing there in shock. Hey, hey. Here, this person is referred to as, the man who is the student council president and, the man that the saintly woman fell in love with. He's in first grade, right? Naftali man. Why did you dress up as a woman during the festival? If it's Bakir, we can send Dolores. Quiet and sincere. Above all, you're so handsome. I'm really sad. You shouldn't have told us. Then you could have helped me a long time ago. Our Dolores I've been saying for a while that she strangely doesn't seem interested in men but it turns out that she just has high standards, right? I heard that a well-behaved cat goes up to the stove first you. How dare you put this sister aside? Girl's talk has begun. It was a flow of conversation that was difficult for Dolores to get used to. Well, that's not it. I'm just a little worried about him. There are more than one suspicious thing. But Dolores' excuse only made the misunderstanding worse. Yeah, yeah that's how it all starts little by little I get worried. I enjoyed listening to the prologue. Now, what about the main part? What? Is Vakir suspicious? Well, he was suspiciously handsome. Your eyes are suspicious, your nose is suspicious, your mouth is suspicious, and your skin is suspicious. I really think you're a person. That's right. Last time I saw you dressed up as a witch at a festival, I was intimidated even though I'm a woman. You have to be at least as good as our Dolores so it won't be a problem. Everyone who has ever seen Bakir dressed as a woman during a festival still talks about it. Realizing that all excuses were meaningless in this situation, Dolores quickly left the club room. Ugh, if this happens, it becomes more difficult to find it. It seemed like I would have to refrain from meeting Vikir for a while. I don't want to spur on the gossip. Right then. As she left the lecture hall and entered the trail, something caught her eye. Ugh. This crazy dog again. Die. Just die. Aya. I got bitten. 
It hurts. Familiar voices were coming from behind the building. Dolores walked towards the place where the voice came from and soon saw an amazing sight. Youth fear, real belt, yellow love, I'm come, red min, south middle. Second year bullies from class B of the cold weapon donation club. This group of three boys and three girls had gathered among themselves and were making a fuss. And in the middle, you can see a black puppy. Rumbling. It was an abandoned dog that Dolores called Chaco. When he was almost expelled from school, his family sent a delegation and begged him for it, and he accepted it after receiving a memorandum promising not to harass the weak again, but is he causing trouble again? Dolores hurriedly stepped forward. You these guys again. I really need to get expelled from school. But she couldn't finish her sentence. That was because the six men and women in front of me were all covered in blood and tattered clothes. Chaco. This black puppy was moving quickly and viciously biting six people with its teeth and nails exposed. Growling. When you see it moving, there are no wild beasts. Although its body size was small, its fighting instinct was jaw-dropping. His strength and speed are such that he cannot compete with most fighting dogs. And these six bullies who were being scratched and bitten were running away crying. Ah oh. If it's not just a promise to the saint, then wow. B but I don't think I can catch it even if I use mana. Just pop out. Aya. What on earth is that dog? That's too fast. Why are you so scared? Dolores stood with a blank expression and watched the gangsters disappearing into the distance. Nucleus Nucleus. The black puppy seemed to be chasing them for a while, but then turned around and walked away. Hey, it's chocolate. Dolores called to the black puppy walking in the opposite direction. The guy turned his head as if he recognized his name. Dolores walked towards the black puppy that had stopped walking and stretched out her hand. The black dog retreated and avoided her touch, but Dolores followed steadfastly and picked him up. Hmm is there a caring owner? There's a scent coming from the fur. Dolores buried her face in the black dog's chin and neck and sniffed it. The soft fur gave off a pleasant scent. A fairly familiar scent. Dolores immediately recognized the identity of the scent. It smells like basic shampoo, an amenity provided in the academy dormitory. I guess the owner is a student. Who is it? If a black dog has ever had a bath, it's probably in the dormitory. Dolores opened her mouth, thinking that she should find out if any of the students living in the dormitory had a black dog. You are you stronger than you look. They kicked out six people. But you still shouldn't fight so recklessly. Those guys couldn't move because my sister had given them a strong warning. It's not like they're attacking other people like this, right? You shouldn't do that. The black dog is just looking somewhere else, not sure if he is listening to Dolores or not. When the guy seemed to ignore her words, Dolores opened her mouth half jokingly and half seriously. Chaco, if you keep ignoring your sister's words, you're going to get me neutered. Then the black dog's ears perked up. Pot. The guy hurriedly escaped from Dolores' arms, kicked the ground, and ran away. Ha. Huh. Chaco, wait. Dolores followed the black dog, but it was much faster than expected and quickly disappeared into the bushes. Well, he's a guy who doesn't give up his side. Like anyone. Dolores laughed. These days, I think there are quite a few cases where men get dumped. Whether the target is the night hound, a vakir, or a chaco. Right then. Okay. A moaning sound came from the floor behind me. When I turned my head, I saw a male student who had been chased by a black dog lying on the ground. Use fear. He is one of the second graders who donate cold bottles. Dolores sighed softly and stood in front of him. Then why did you bother the puppy who couldn't speak again? Oh, it's unfair, chairman. This time, that bitch, no, the dog attacked us first. Does that make sense? How could that little kid attack you first? No, the chairman saw it earlier too. That guy's teeth and nails are really sharp. How fast is it? Even faster than the wolves that my family domesticated. Stop. No more excuses. Yuspira, 
who receives the disdainful gaze from Dolores, feels truly aggrieved. Ha! In the past, I was attacked by the Hounds of the Night, but why am I so unlucky these days? Dolores flinched for a moment as Yusfir mumbled his words in passing. You! What did you just mutter? Yes. Ah. That doesn't mean you're unlucky, I really don't have anything going on these days. Not that one. Previously. Yes. Ah, the night hound. Yusfir seemed to hesitate for a moment, then ran his hand through his bangs. X. Then I saw a faint knife mark scar left there. Once upon a time, while I was walking down the street at night, I got caught by a masked crazy guy and it ended up like this. Masked crazy guy? Yes. But I didn't know it at the time. Now that I think about it, I have the same facial expression as the villain who was the hound of the night or something. Yusfir's testimony was surprising. According to his statement, Yusfir and his five gangster friends had met the hound of the night in person. And that was before the movements of the night hound were reported in the media. Dolores asked with a serious expression. Therefore, the date you met the night hounds was the day of the new student welcome party. Yes, yes. Yes. That was before the night hound was even called the night hound. This was before the terrorist attack in the imperial capital. That's right. That's right. I remember it clearly. That stork beak mask. A voice that sounded like scraping metal. Yusfer continued speaking, completely intimidated by Dolores's spirit. We tried really hard to find it too. They also hire a criminal investigation agency. But everything failed. I can't seem to get my head around it. Of course. Even though the Imperial Guard and the Imperial Army tracked him down, they couldn't catch him. That was back when the Night Hounds weren't that infamous. Will they now accept our request because the crime investigation agencies are crazy? Dolores was troubled after hearing Yusfer's words. Why did the Night Hound attack them? Dolores had investigated the backgrounds of these six gangsters in detail in order to get them expelled. According to the results of the investigation at that time, these six gangsters were really frogs in a well, with no scope of activity other than their own territory and school. So there won't be any grudges with people outside. What does that mean? It seems that the Night Hound has some connection with this academy. I had that strong feeling. Yusbir spoke trembling as if recalling the nightmare of that day. He knew not only our names, but also our parents' names and our family's location in detail. Dolores did some quick calculations. If you're that familiar with school information, you probably aren't a freshman. At least second year or more, or third year. This is a hypothesis I have been thinking about for a long time. As a result, the probability that an informant led by the Night Hound exists within the academy has further increased. There was also an extremely slim chance that the Night Hound himself was working within the academy. Dolores turned her head and looked down at Yusfir. Pot. A white light arises and heals his wounds. When Yusfir looked up with a blank expression, Dolores spoke in a stern voice. You. Make sure to keep what I just said a secret. Yes. I'm telling you not to tell anyone. I'll take care of it from now on. At Dolores's urging, Yusbir nodded absently. Well, the eye can only see something, so maybe he understood that Dolores was trying to steal the credit by reporting their testimony. But the more scoundrels like this are, the weaker they are against the strong. Yusfir was only able to be released after making a promise not only to himself but also to his friends. Keep in mind. If anyone else hears this, you will be expelled. Leaving Dolores bloody threats behind. Episode 236, National University League, 1. There was a strange aura in the air these days at Colosio Academy, the best university in the empire. The reason was that the date of the joint conference held by the Empire's top universities was approaching. National University League An annual event where four universities representing the Empire gather in one place to determine superiority or inferiority. Colosio Academy always maintained the best grades in the annual university evaluation, but in fact, the other three universities were also formidable rivals. Colosio Academy Colosio Academy 
Varangian Training Center. Boot Camp Varangian. Magic Tower. Magic Tower. Themyscira Women's College. Themyscira Women's University. The remaining three prominent universities that are following closely behind Colossio Academy are Varangian, Tower of Magic, and Themyscira. Varangian is a northern university famous as a warrior training center and was a specialized college specializing in cold weapons such as swords, spears, axes, and bows. Magic Tower is also a specialized college in the eastern part of the country, famous as a Dharma training center, and those who walk the path of magic gather here to pursue their studies. Of course, it is a fever weapon to deal with. The Miskara is a southern university with an education system most similar to the Colossio Academy. Students attending this school can choose cold weapons or hot weapons as their major depending on their talent, aptitude, and taste, and can choose other studies as a minor, double major, or liberal arts. However, the difference from Colossio Academy is that the students admitted are limited to women. Except for extremely unusual cases. As the showdown with these prominent rivals approaches, there is tension at Colossio Academy like the eve of a storm. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair, the first-year students at Colossio, did just that. It's my first time meeting people from other schools. Being first is painful. If you do well, you can make a profit, but if you don't, you lose. I'm a little nervous. Can I do well? What did you drop? I'm doing well in Colossio. That's right in the end, we're all the same age. Since they are new students, they seem to have a lot of questions about the culture and school atmosphere of other schools. Meanwhile, Sinclair and Sancho were receiving the attention of other students because they had experience taking entrance exams for other schools. Now that I think about it, didn't Sancho come in first place in the Varangian entrance exam? The kids over there will gnash their teeth whenever they see Sancho. Why are you grinding your teeth? Of course I will go. Because they abandoned their school and went somewhere else. Will it look good? So Sinclair is in bigger trouble. He was first in the Magic Tower entrance exam and first in the Themyscira entrance exam. I don't know, but there must be a lot of kids studying for him at other schools. Sinclair was even a monster who came in first place in all entrance exams for universities with magic departments, such as Tower of Magic, Themyscira, and Colossio. I don't know, but it seems certain that I would receive a lot of jealous looks. At that time, a male student wearing a black cape appeared with an arrogant attitude. Don't worry, you foolish friends. I will personally go to the competition and give you a true education in lowly matters. It was Granui Leviathan. Since he had recently joined the noble faction as a new member, he had become quite proud. Tudor, who had always thought poorly of Granui, said sarcastically. Hey, you little bastard. Are you going to the competition too? What kind of rude words are you saying? Don't you know that there is no grade limit for this competition? Anyone who has no record of taking the same subject more than twice, such as repeating a grade, deferring graduation, or retaking the course, can participate. I'm asking because I don't know anyone. Tudor quickly lost interest and turned his head away, but Granui's temperament of admonishment and explanation seems to have remained the same. I will personally explain the nature and rules of the competition to you little ones. 1. The official name of the competition held by the four university leagues is Olympiad Survival Contest, and the other name is Battle Royale Ground Zero. 2. A total of 400 students are placed in a randomly assigned large space in a warp, and the task is to somehow survive within the warp for a limited time. 3. Everyone enters the game wearing an HP suit, and the moment their HP reaches zero, they are automatically eliminated. 4. The top 10 people who achieve good results in the competition for survival will be awarded a world-class artifact stored in a treasure trove jointly managed by the four universities. Now that I've explained it to you in such detail, please refrain from doing anything that holds me back during the competition. Granui finished his explanation with a proud attitude. At that time. Puck. There was a being who hit Granui on the shoulder. Oh, what? Who dares to touch this body? Granui turned his head with an annoyed expression. Standing there was a tall male student with black hair and red eyes. What? Hi bro Baskerville. 
He, who reigns supreme in Cold Weapon Division B class, is looking down on Granui. Granui looked up in silence for a moment at Hybro's face, who was more than two spans taller than him. I also knew Granui, who was usually very arrogant. That's how damn temperamental Hybro from Cold Weapon Donation Class B is. Oh, no. You suck. Hybro glanced Granui up and down and then hurried away. You suck. You suck. What was even more infuriating was that the gazes of middle bro and low bro followed behind him. Granui, left alone, began to tremble. Um, are those crazy dogs really? Even if there weren't three people rushing around, would have scolded them. Oh, you're a gangster, you're a gangster. Everyone was looking at Granui with sad eyes. At that time. At the corner where high bro, middle bro, and low bro passed, one more male student was seen walking. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair, who saw that face, shouted happily. Vikir. It's here. Good morning today, friend. Did you see the dating rumors, Vikir? Is that real? No. With the real student council president? Ugh. Of course not. You said you weren't interested in dating. Friends soon surrounded Vikir and started talking about this competition. But the real dating rumor? You say it's not Vikir. Rather, I think it will be possible to participate without grade restrictions this time. If there are 100 students in each school, roughly 20 students will be assigned to the first grade. That's right. The actual aces are third graders. It is customary for fourth graders not to participate. Isn't there roughly 50 third-year students, 32nd-year students, and 21st-year students? We got good grades on the midterm exam, so of course we will be included. The conversation eventually turns to Vakir. Tudor asked. So Vakir. What will Joe do? I see that scores are evaluated individually, but participation itself must be done in groups. Five people per group. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy. Bianca, Sinclair, Bakir. There are usually six people in the group we hang out with, so it is a bit difficult for everyone to form a group. It would be better to split the situation into three groups of three. Okay. It would be better to make it three to three and let's have two different kids in each group. Okay then, Bakir, join our group for now. What is it, why are you taking Bakir as you please? That's right. This should be done fairly and by lot. I'm going to the group where Vakir is. This is shameful. I want to be in the same group as you this time. In a situation where the team is divided into two groups, everyone wants to be in the same group as Vakir. But in this situation, Vakir came up with a different answer. Hmm. I'm already in another group. What? Also. It was like that during the midterm exam. This too is a prior promise. I feel sorry. The friends looked blatantly offended by Vakir's answer. In particular, Sinclair was most noticeably depressed. I wanted to be in the same group as you this time. Hmm. I feel sorry once again. This time, I also have a pretty clear sense of purpose. Everyone's eyes widened at Vakir's words. Purpose? Since it was the first time that Vakir revealed his true feelings, everyone forgot their disappointment and showed curiosity. And for some reason, Vakir happily answered. I heard that if you place in the top 10 in this competition, you can receive a piece of treasure stored in a treasure trove jointly managed by the four universities. Vakir spoke with a rare twinkle in his eye. At that sight, Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair all tilted their heads as if they were surprised. This was the first time I had seen Vakir want something so blatantly. Is there any treasure you're after? Yes. What is that? It's a secret. Oh what? I was wondering why you would tell me. Tudor, who has an impatient personality, is the first to shout. Sinclair, who usually kept a lot of secrets, also had his eyes shining. It looks like you have a separate artifact you are aiming for. So do I. But you know what? Just because you entered the treasure trove doesn't mean you can always get the treasure. I guess it's only possible if you are chosen by the treasure. 
Artifacts that can be considered world-class treasures are stored in the treasure troves managed by the four major universities. It is said that they all have spirituality and do not wait to be chosen by their master, but rather choose their master and go to him on their own. An artifact that meets its owner stays with the owner until its lifespan expires, after which it returns to the warehouse. Sinclair smiled brightly and continued. In other words, I have to choose one of the artifacts that choose me. They say I can't always have what I want. Even if you enter the warehouse and are not selected by any artifact, you will have to return empty-handed. However, such restrictions were of no concern to Vakir, who had memories of before returning. First of all, you just need to be able to enter the treasure trove. That's because Vakir's ultimate goal was not to possess the artifact, but to destroy it. Vakir thought about what he had to choose when he entered the treasure trove. 7th Sisangsi it will be sleeping in the treasure trove. Among the ten demons, he is the only one that exists in the form of an object. That was the existence of the seventh poem, Decorabia. Episode 237, National University League, 2. Colossio Academy, Varangian Training Center, Magic Tower, Themyscira Women's College. There are only a few days left until the National University League, hosted by four prominent academies, opens. Before that, the students of Colossio Academy embarked on a journey to the Magic Tower, the venue for this competition. Ugh. It's been so long since I went out I'm finally going out of the Imperial Capital. I thought I would die of frustration because I thought I had to wait until vacation. Although I can't see the wide lake of Singumbi, I have to be satisfied with this as it is a shame. Of course, a great archer must have a broad insight before a broad vision. Bianca was wearing a colorful floral shirt, shorts, sunglasses, a straw hat, and cool-looking sandals, and was humming while dragging a large suitcase. Judging by the praise he gives to the famous archer whenever he is in a good mood, he seems to be quite excited. Tudor, who saw this, spoke as if he was displeased. Who would think you were going on a trip to some resort? What are you going to do if your grades fail and you lose in the competition? Was the person who said that wearing a swimsuit under her skirt? W what are you talking about? Is this crazy? How do you know if I'm wearing a swimsuit or not? I saw your skirt flapping in the wind earlier. Hey you pervert. Why are you looking at that? If you think about it that way, you're even more perverted for wearing a skirt. Joy. In our Don Quixote family, men also traditionally wear skirts. Okay, anyway, I didn't want to see it, but you forced me to see it while you were walking ahead. And it's not even panties, but a swimsuit is meant to be exposed anyway. I'm going to sue. What are you going to eat? What's the point of filing a complaint? I'm going to sue you for insult, you bastard. Then, I will also file a complaint for personal injury. I was already losing my eyesight when I saw you in your swimsuit. Tudor and Bianca are busy bickering today as well. Sancho, Piggy, and Sinclair saw it and laughed at the sight, which was no different from usual. You are both in good spirits today as well. I'm going to hate you if you do that. I think it's already on the stretcher. The two of you have been childhood friends since you were very young. The University League, the Olympiad Survival Contest, is usually held by four universities in order, but this time it was the turn of Magic Tower, located in the eastern part of the continent, to take over the hosting rights. The place where the Magic Tower is located is the Dortsmile region in the southeastern part of the continent, which is famous as a resort area due to its mild climate and abundant tourist attractions such as deserts, forests, caves, valleys, and the sea. To get to this warm and cozy place, you had to follow a long train that passes through the Imperial Capital, which is why the students of Colossio Academy are here today at the train station. Magic Train It is an enormous train that travels around the continent. A type of truly gigantic magic tool that creates firepower by inserting mana stones into the furnace of the engine room attached to the front and rear compartments. This gigantic artifact, which transports countless people from one end of the continent to the other, was created by the magicians of the empire through their combined efforts and is considered the essence of magical engineering. Students at Colossio Academy board this train today to travel from the ecliptic to the southeastern part of the continent. Wangdo Station Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Soon the train enters the platform. 
Ding 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 the continental circulation, continental circulation train is coming in now. This station is Huangdu, Huangdu station. The door to get off is on the right. The distance between the boarding area and the platform at this station is wide, so please be careful when getting off. Thank you for using our motto train today. Goodbye. A huge steel snake approaches the platform and stops, wading through the hazy vapor emitted by burning mana stones. Then Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair each said a word. Wow, this is awesome. It's my first time riding the magic train. Hee <laughs> hee. Tudor, you have a bit of a hillbilly side. I rode it once when I came to enroll. Actually, it's my first time too. I've used the teleportation scroll once before. Don't react so stupidly once you get on the train. Inside, there are students from Varangian and Themyscira who came from all over the station. Since they are all rivals, we must all ride with determination and not be looked down on. The students of Colossio Academy boarded the train with stern expressions to hide their pounding hearts. The exterior of the train, which had traveled a long distance, was hot and hard. From the moment I climbed the stairs, I felt a warm feeling on the soles of my feet. But when I actually got inside, I didn't feel that heat at all. A space where a comfortable temperature is always maintained due to magic. As soon as Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair boarded the train, they were a little nervous because they thought they might encounter the enemies they would face in the competition unfortunately or fortunately, the compartment in the train was empty. Ah, the platform has been divided so that only Colossio Academy students can ride. We rented this space. Everyone nodded at Tudor's words. I was glad that there was no fight, but I was also a little disappointed. At that time. Uh. Hey, I think it's them. Bianca, who had good eyesight as an archer, stretched out her hand toward the window. While the train was stopped, there were people who came out of the platform to buy something or look outside. They were divided into two groups. On one side, there were students wearing thick, sturdy heavy armor and impressive chain armor underneath it. Up to 99% of them were men of sturdy build, and each had a shield, axe, greatsword, crossbow, etc. on their backs. They are the students of the Varangian Training Center. It seems as if several Sanchos have gathered together. What are you doing when you're not there? Ha, huh, that's right. These are familiar outfits in the north. When Tudor looked back at Sancho next to him and smiled, Sancho also smiled awkwardly. Meanwhile, on the other side, there were female students wearing white school uniforms and capes with rows of Sharon on them. Up to 99% of them were women of sturdy stature, and each carried a shield, axe, greatsword, crossbow, magic wand, spellbook, etc. on their backs. They are the students of Themyscira Women's College. Does it look bloody? I heard those girls over there are so good at fighting. Bianca and Sinclair also swallowed their voices. These are the warriors of Varangian and Themyscira who will compete in this competition. It seemed clear that it would not be an easy fight to make everyone look powerful, regardless of gender or gender. And around that time. Pooh. The train departed with the sound of a whistle as the mana stone in the furnace burned. A huge piece of iron pulsates and pulsates powerfully with the power of mana. The train started running towards the magic tower in the distance. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair moved to find the seats written on their train tickets, and soon entered a room-like space and sat in a circle. A round table was placed in the center of the room inside the train, and spaces were divided for individual use. Students at Colossio Academy will now travel for long periods of time sitting or lying on soft sofas. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair admired the scenery of the ecliptic passing quickly outside the window. Wow, that's really fast. There's no need to use expensive teleportation scrolls. I'll go to the concession stand and get some eggs and cider. Normally, you have to eat these things when traveling on a train. Yay! I already packed. Oh, Piggy knows something. Wow, it feels like I'm really going to have fun. It feels like I'm already on a school trip. And suddenly. The friends thought of another friend who was not present. Vikir. I would have felt even better if that friend had been with me, 
but unfortunately, he wasn't there with me, so I felt a little discouraged. Tudor was the first to speak. Vikir, you traitor. You abandoned us again and formed a group with other kids. I'm really sad this time. They say it's a prior contract, but there's nothing we can do about it, right? It's unfortunate that we couldn't be in the same group, but it was still nice to see them attaching importance to promises. It's clear that Bakir considers the promise he made to us very important. Anyway, where is Bakir's seat? If it's him, he's probably in Khan, which is quite far away from us, right? I heard it's a seat right next to the compartment where the Themyscira kids are riding. OMG. Something won't happen to you, right? The seat where Vakir was currently staying was in a train compartment far behind here. And it is said that the contestants from Themyscira Women's University are riding in the compartment right behind the train car. Aren't you going to start a fight with that guy for no reason? Maybe we'll end up flirting instead of arguing or fighting. That's right. Vakir is very handsome. It's already famous outside the ecliptic. I heard that because Themyscira is a women's college, the desire for handsome men is very strong. It's a similar case to Varangian, which is an extremely male college, so the desire for pretty women is very strong. The friends who were talking about Vakir soon spoke as if they were worried. By the way. I'm really worried about Vakir in many ways. Right. The same group members inside can make it more difficult for Vakir than Themyscira on the outside. I agree too. Even if Granui said so. You're in the same group with high bro, middle bro, and low bro, the so-called crazy dogs of the cold arms donation department. They are definitely trying to exploit my brother. It was like that during the midterm exam. Currently, Bakir's group was called Hell's Group. High bro less Baskerville. Middle bro less Baskerville. Low bro less Baskerville. Granui de Leviathan. Vikir. There are five people in the same group. From Granui, who is known for his arrogance in donating hot bottles, to the triplets of the Baskerville family, who are famous for donating cold bottles. Friends are very worried because they do not know what kind of humiliation and humiliation Vikir, a commoner, may be experiencing alone. But. In the back compartment of the train, a scene quite different from what my friends were worried about was unfolding. Episode 238, National University League, 3. Granui de Leviathan. As the third son of the extremely poisonous Leviathan family, one of the seven great families of the empire, he has lived his whole life being respected. He grew up with the praise and expectations of being the best genius in his family, and has never once allowed anyone to be on top of him. Until I entered Colossio Academy. Ranked second in terms of entrance exam scores. From the beginning, something was unusual. There are limits to achieving a mental victory just because the levels of donation for hot and cold illnesses are different. Granui looked at the woman who had stepped on him. Sinclair. A commoner without a saint. Granui decided to ignore this impossible event as the first and last miracle that befell the commoners of lower class life. However, the rankings did not change even in the midterm exam. Sinclair is always on top of his head. Looking at her, Granui struggled with her inferiority complex and hatred. But why? The more he struggled, the more strange feelings arose in Granui's heart. No, maybe it was a feeling that arose from the moment I first saw her. A white head that stands out anywhere. Clean skin. Big eyes like a deer. A tight nose and lips. Every time Granui thought of Sinclair, he found himself rooting for her in his heart. I thought it was ridiculous, but it was an unavoidable fact. From then on, Granui diligently hovered around Sinclair, trying to get at least one word from her. When we happen to meet each other, we habitually say things like, commoners, while blaming myself for not being able to say anything but such barbed words. And around that time, an eyesore appeared. Vikir. An ordinary, guy with nothing special about him. At best, all the female students in the school are acting like they would give this guy a good job and a fair face. Sinclair, who had been watching for a long time, was also approaching first, subtly expressing his interest. Nonsense. This can't happen. Granui himself hasn't been able to stop talking until now, 
but they are already in a relationship where they do volunteer work and study together. So Granui made his decision. I decided to be in the same group as Vakir in this competition. So I decided to reveal his inferiority even more clearly with my own superiority. I'll humiliate you in front of Sinclair. If that happens, won't she see herself again at least a little bit? Wouldn't we find out who the cooler, stronger man is? Granui thought so. Koham. Granui sat down in front of the round table. At the round table were members of the same group from this competition. Granui handed his luggage to Vakir in the front and told him to put it in the luggage locker above. Hey, commoner. Put my luggage on your head. However, it felt a little awkward to do it without a thought. It wasn't that Bakir was scary, but because of the humans on both sides of it. High bro, middle bro, low bro. The three brothers of the Baskervilles. Since they were vaguely occupying the seats on either side of Bakir, Granui couldn't help but notice them a little. But Granui remained determined. Okay. Let's not be scared by these guys. I am the person who will lead this group. The seating arrangement was in a circle in the following order, high bro, middle bro, Bakir, low bro, and Granui. Granui skipped low bro next to him and spoke again to Bakir next to him. Hey, commoner. Can't you hear me? Take my luggage and put it on your head. Bakir, who had been meditating with his eyes closed, opened one eye. Granui's luggage was placed in front of him. What are you doing? I don't accept it. Look at this kid. What a dog. What are you doing, believing in your grades during the midterm exam? A lucky child, where did you pick up some information about monsters? At that time. Low bro, who was between Vikir and Granui, opened his mouth. Shut up. Because it's noisy. Granui's expression hardened at those words. Shut up. Is that what you just said to me? The expression you want. It was Granui's first time experiencing such an open argument. Isn't it he, the successor to the Leviathan family, that even the seniors of the noble faction are starting to notice? What did you say just now? Granui asked as if it were absurd. When Lobro closed his eyes and didn't even respond as if he was annoyed, Granui became even more bewildered. No, I don't know if it's Hybro, but now even the toughest guy is going to climb on me. The most famous of the Baskerville triplets is the eldest, Hybro. This is because they are the strongest and have the best grades. The two younger brothers, Middle Bro and Low Bro, felt like they were High Bro's subordinates, following him around, so the absurdity that Granui was feeling right now was even greater. I can't do this. If you want to dominate this group, you have to show charisma from the start. Granui closed his eyes and sighed deeply. Ah, I just got on the train and these bastards are pissing me off again. Then take just one more person. Dolores spoke to Professor Banshee just before leaving Can. I had planned to accompany Vakir on his mission to find Professor Sutty. There are things to talk about, though. But Professor Banshee just tilts his head. One more. Who? Well, here huh. As soon as Dolores turned her head, she couldn't help but widen her eyes. This is because the place where Vakir was standing just moments ago was empty. It almost got annoying. Vakir was standing on top of a moving train, facing the wind. As soon as he sensed that Dolores was planning to carry out a water ghost operation, he immediately opened the window and climbed up the wall of the train and onto the ceiling. All of these actions took place in the blink of an eye, like the actions of a ghost, so no one noticed. Vikir walked on the train with a leisurely pace and soon climbed down through the window of the opposite compartment. Fortunately, there was no one in the aisle connecting the compartments, so I was able to easily return to the inside of the train. Is it a middle ground between Colossio Academy and Themyscira Women's University? This is the area where the middle part of the magic train begins, and from this point on, this is where the female student corps of Themyscira stays. If I had gone one step further back, I would have ended up in the middle of a crowded place with female students. It was a two-story building from the back compartment, and a thin bulkhead blocked the stairs. So, the place where Vakir came in through the window is on the second floor of the guest room. The space where the female students of Themyscira stayed had an overall quiet atmosphere and the fragrant smell of tea was in the air. 
Only the elegant heavy metal music that noble ladies would enjoy listening to is heard softly. Vikir stood in front of the car window for a moment and thought about the future. First of all, you have to appease Granui, who treats you like a commoner and ignores you, and continue group activities. Even though scores are calculated individually, the initial start took the form of a group task, so we had to work together and cry. Of course, Vikir didn't care about such things at all still, the assortment needs to be right. Therefore, it was decided to hire the Baskerville family triplets. Why are we so needlessly obsessed with our origins? Vikir thought for a moment about Granui's attitude. Vikir does not know who his mother is. I heard that she was an actor and dancer who hung out with Hugo for a while, but that wasn't accurate either. Miscellaneous thoughts bite after miscellaneous thoughts. Now that I think about it, I think I heard that among the freshmen in this class of twenty, there is a member of the royal family. This too is an inaccurate statement. There is a rumor that a royal family member, almost an illegitimate child, who does not know what rank he is in the line of succession to the throne, has entered the Colossio Academy. No matter how bad it was, the royal family was the royal family, so many people were paying close attention. There were rumors that some professors had already noticed. Well, it has nothing to do with me. Vikir closed his eyes and shook away the distracting thoughts. And then I walked back to the first floor of my original room. At that time, I started hearing strange noises from the stairs. Instead of opening the door and going out, Vikir listened to the sound coming from the passage on the first floor for a moment. But, the voice coming from there was quite familiar. Ah, the smell of a commoner. The smell must have soaked into my clothes. I have to pay for laundry in a humane way. Rather than that, if you bump into someone, shouldn't you apologize first? Oh dear. I heard you're the head of the Great Colossio Academy. That's right I guess you're so smart that you don't know how to apologize. Female students wearing Themyscira school uniforms stare at the wall with menacing eyes. And there was a female student standing in that corner. It was Sinclair. She opened her mouth without being discouraged. We must avoid each other in the aisles. I couldn't avoid it, but he couldn't avoid it either, so isn't it both parties' fault? Well, I don't know if I was able to avoid it or not. Oh. So, are you saying you are the victim now? The amount of loss is different for each person. The girl who bumped into Sinclair fiddled with the shawl on her shoulder as if she was shocked. It was a shawl that looked quite expensive at first glance. Hey. I guess you don't know because you are a commoner. The laundry fee for this shawl alone is equivalent to three semesters of tuition at your school. Limited edition, limited edition. The person currently scolding Sinclair was Merlini e. Lovegood, the senior third-year student at the Miscara Women's College and student council president. The Merlini e. family is a famous wealthy family in the empire, and they are a maternal family of a bourgeois family, so they are traditional wealthy families with great power. Love Good, a member of that family, was also a very proud student. She was also very proud of the fact that she was a student at the Miscara Women's University, and perhaps because of that, she also had a slightly hooligan-like temperament. Is that why? As soon as Love Good met Sinclair, he started a very blatant argument. Even though we got top honors in the Miscara's entrance exam, you went to another school. Insolent. Besides that, the fact that he is the chief in the Magic Tower and the chief in the Colossio is worthy of frowning. In fact, when Lovegood was taking the entrance exam for Themyscira Women's University, she also took the entrance exam for the Colossio Academy, but did not pass the exam, which made her feel even more uncomfortable. So, when I met Sinclair here today, I started an argument because I thought it went well. But. Oh, that shawl. I know the selling price. Although it is a limited edition, it is a model that is old and has depreciated in value, so the used price is very low. Probably not to the extent you mentioned. Sinclair opened his mouth in a bright tone. Then Lovegood got angry. You're laughing. There are cases where a premium is charged because it is used, right? This is a favorite item that a famous singer actually wore. This is what actor G. Pistol actually used. Don't you know about celebrity premium? If a premium is attached to a product just because it was used by a celebrity of that level, then the original brand value is understandable. 
Sinclair's answer was surprisingly cold and sharp. Her face, which was always smiling brightly, is now dry and cold without a trace of smile. A vein appeared on Lovegood's forehead. No, but this little guy has been acting arrogant towards my senior since a while ago. She's not a senior at our school, right? Oh, ma'am. You are quite a bit older, but is it Themiscarus' duty to persecute new students from other schools, especially students who entered early, like this? And. This. If this is what Themiscara does, then I have nothing to say. Sinclair continued in a whisper. It's a good thing I didn't go to that school. It was the final bang. Then the female students of Themiscara, including Lovegood, began to surround Sinclair with grim expressions. You you. Lovegood trembled and took out the magic wand on his back. A bright mana light sparkled in pink from a crude iron club with a star-shaped metal attachment. It looked like Lovegood was preparing some magic. And Sinclair, too, widened his eyes and tried to fight off Lovegood's attack. At that time. Pot. There was someone who instantly dispersed the mana that spewed out from Lovegood's magic wand. Stop. Soon, a large shadow appeared in front of Sinclair. Lovegood was also startled by the black curtain blocking his path and had to take a half step back. Vikir. He was standing between Sinclair and Lovegood, holding the passage door handle. Episode 240 National University League, 5. Ah uh oh. Brother. Sinclair looks embarrassed. It was rare. Vikir looked down at Sinclair in silence. Compared to when I entered school, I have grown quite a bit, so the height difference is now quite large. Eventually, Bakir's mouth opened briefly. Door. Sinclair tilted his head for a moment, unable to understand what Bakir was saying. And soon. Ah, do you want me to open the door for you? Okay, sorry. Sinclair took a large step to the side. Only then did Bakir nod, open the door, and go out beyond the compartment. And. Even after crossing the compartment, Bakir did not close the door and kept it open. Then Sinclair nodded again. Ah, uh, don't you want to fight with the students from other schools and come over here quickly? Bakir quietly nodded in response to Sinclair's interpretation. In the compartment behind there are participants from Themyscira Women's University. Avoid contact as much as possible before the competition. Because they might start a fight. There's also advice from Dolores just now, so you can't pretend not to see the conflict. This is especially true because I received a lot of help from Sinclair regarding the genealogy of the paper test and the scope of the test. Right then. There were people who grabbed Vakir who was trying to take Sinclair away. For a moment. Who are you to meddle in women's affairs? The female students of Themyscira began to protest against Vakir. At the forefront of the fierce protest was Lovegood, the student council president. She spoke firmly to Vakir. That child insulted our school. So, we need to determine the exact right and wrong with us. If you interfere with that, you too will be held responsible. First, please provide your student number, affiliation, and name. Official complaint to Colossio Academy. The moment when Lovegood is about to declare war on Vakir. YNG. A gust of wind came from the second floor window that Vakir had opened. It came down the stairs and made the hair of the people on the first floor fly all over the place. And so did Vakir. Fluttering. The hem of his black coat swayed, and soon his messy black hair also fell back. Vakir's bare face was completely exposed. At that moment, the expressions on the faces of the students at Themyscira Women's College became blank. An expression that makes them not know what they are seeing or what they are staring at. Um, what is that? Is this a human face? How is it so small? But all the facial features are in there. It's even very clear and dark. Isn't it a painting? Or a statue? After a moment of silence, a small whisper is heard from behind. But just one. Only Love Good, the student council president of Themyscira, was completely unfazed. Oh, I forgot. In order to amicably resolve the dispute with our school, we will ask for some personal information again. First, please provide your student number, affiliation, and name. 
and love good, in a calm, cool-headed and rational manner, requested the necessary information from Vakir for the procedure. Year, month, hour of birth. Key. Weight. Blood type. Hometown. Constellation. View of love. Hobby. Specialty. Your favorite foods. Raised animals. Do you currently have a girlfriend? If not, is there anyone who likes it? What type of woman do you think is your ideal type? When was your last relationship? How many relationships have you had so far? When will you get married? What do your parents like as gifts? How many children should I have? Do you like the son or the daughter? And the name compatibility with me? Really? Because I really need it. It was definitely an administrative procedure that forced me to ask questions. The magic train has already arrived at the magic tower in the eastern part of the continent. Ding 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 the continental circulation, continental circulation train is coming in now. This station is magic top, magic tower, magic top station. The door to get off is on the left. Passengers who wish to transfer to Dortsmail station are advised to transfer to the inner circle train here. The distance between the boarding area and the platform at this station is wide, so please be careful when getting off. Thank you for using our motto train today. Goodbye. The train stops for a while. The passengers inside began to pile up. Of course, the crowd included students from Colosio Academy, Varangian Training Center, and Themyscira Women's College. And a welcoming crowd from Magic Tower can be seen waiting at the station to greet them. Meanwhile, Vikir also got off the train and looked around. Behind the numerous people gathered, the charming scenery of the city is serene. Dortsmile City in the southeastern part of the empire is also famous as the area where the Magic Tower exists. The cozy city becomes even more dreamy and idyllic as it is bathed in the red sunset. And in the middle of the city, I saw a tower rising so high that it seemed to pierce the sun. That's the Magic Tower. Vikir looked at the Magic Tower in the distance, filled with emotion. At first glance, it is just a narrow and tall building. However, there were countless multiple spaces inside that tower, so the extent and height of the tower could not be determined. The inner space of that tower, which is said to have been built by the wizard of the beginning, must be almost infinite. Because there was such a high level of dimensional distortion, even modern wizards did not accurately understand its principles. I have something similar. Vikir looked down at the ring on his finger. Ring of sacred inviolability slash ring. Barrier, off. Finit hic deus, the realm of God ends here. It is a relic left behind by Andromalius that can distort the dimension and create subspace. However, once used, it consumes a lot of mana and the time it takes for the power to return is so long that it cannot be abused carelessly. When Vikir was looking down at the ring and thinking about various things. Hey, bro. There was a hand tapping Vikir's back from behind. It was Sinclair. She hesitated a little, but then smiled brightly and spoke as usual. Thank you for helping me earlier. As Vikir nodded, Sinclair let out a small sigh. Actually, I was very scared. They seem like strong sisters. I was scared too. Ahahaha, lie. Sinclair smiled brightly as usual and pulled on Vikir's collar. But. My brother must have been nervous too. Because the other person was that love good dot. Even though Vikir did not show any reaction, Sinclair continued speaking on his own. Oh, look over there. It's a welcome crowd from the Magic Tower. I'm meeting with participants from Varangian and Themyscira. As expected, participants from the four schools participating in this competition were gathering together. The person at the forefront was, of course, Dolores Rune Corvades, the student council president of Colosio Academy. She led the students with her calm and kind charisma and soon stood in the center of the welcoming crowd. It's been a while, everyone. Student council presidents from the three remaining schools stepped forward in the direction Dolores was greeting. The student council president of the Varangian Training Center walked forward first. Tall height, long, bald hair, muscular body covered in scars. Wahahaha, it's been a while, everyone. Hasn't it been a little less than a year? 
he was the Varangian Student Council President, Jurassic Bakaraga. Having participated in competitions since his freshman and sophomore years and consistently recording top grades, he entered the competition as an ace in his third year and was aiming to win in earnest. And his powerful rival came out at the forefront of the Magic Tower's welcome crowd. A handsome face, tall stature, and a cold aura radiating from his entire body. To be exact, eleven months and three days. It's been eleven hours, forty-two minutes and twelve seconds. If I were to take the time from when I last took my eyes off you at last year's competition to when I just found your face in the crowd. The student council president of Magic Tower is Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombast von Hohenheim. However, instead of the last name Hohenheim or Aurelius, he mainly used the baptismal name used only in the Tower of Magic. A smart ass with a high nose. This was Hohenheim's current name. At Magic Tower, there is a tradition of seniors giving baptismal names to their juniors. The students at Magic Tower are Talented Little Pig, Curly Broom, Baby Bird Sleeping in the Classroom, Palm Tree Standing in the Hallway, Toilet Bowl, etc. Over the past four years, he has used these baptismal names more often than his real name, such as The Lump of Curiosity That Blocks, Drunken Gorilla, Dwarf in a Flask, etc. It was a culture that showed how great their pride was. Actually, this is why I didn't go to the magic tower. You're going to call me Fluffy Cotton, I don't know. Sinclair whispered in Bakir's ear. Meanwhile, as soon as Hohenheim and Bakaraga met, they began to fight. Bakaraga spoke first. Ha ha ha, we are the ace this time. Last year, we didn't make it into the top ten because our seniors were so active, but this year will be different. I've trained like crazy for the past year, and the win is mine. Well, with your ignorant strength, you might be able to get a place in the top 10. But any more than that is too much. Our Magic Tower's elites will take over positions from 1st to 9th. Artifacts belong to the Magic Tower. Hohenheim also shows strong confidence. Naturally, a confrontational structure of warrior versus wizard was being created. And Vikir was watching the confrontation between the two from a distance in the crowd. Sinclair told Vikir next to him brief information about the two people. Jurejo Bakira is a warrior famous for his strength. I think he took over the school by beating up all the fourth graders at the senior-slash-junior reunion when he was a freshman. I heard that the only thing he lacks is experience, but now that he is in his third year, he must have gained some of that experience as well. Is it? He certainly looks strong. It's probably the result of natural talent plus constant effort. Rumors say that his grandparents were barbarians who lived in the waters of the Red and Black Mountains, but I'm not sure. Sinclair shifted his gaze and looked at the man next to him. Actually, Bakira is also a person of interest, maybe it's because I'm a wizard, but I was more concerned about that guy named Hohenheim. Is it? Yes. Even President Dolores of the World couldn't beat the author once throughout the college league. And it looks like Hohenheim has already decided to go to graduate school after graduation. He was told that after graduation, he would automatically be appointed to a professorship at the Magic Tower. From what I heard, they are targeting the youngest Magic Tower Lord. If you were the head of the Magic Tower, wouldn't your status be equivalent to that of the head of the Seventh Great Family? Hohenheim was clearly a man of great ambition. Sinclair continued speaking. I think Hohenheim and Bakira will probably fight for first and second place in this competition. And with a high probability, third place is our president Dolores. Isn't fourth place the love good of Themyscira? Come to think of it, I don't see Themyscira's love good. Sinclair raised his head and looked around. But? An unexpected sight was seen. Merlini love good. And the female warriors of Themis Chira who follow her. Their expressions, which were always strict, solemn, and serious, seemed slightly blank today for some reason.